This is, as uh, you all know from your uh, invitations, uh, part of a series of forums which uh, uh, USC and American University and Current are all doing uh, in uh, partnership with each other, uh, looking at the future of public service media, and specifically uh, re presenting current research, no pun intended, and, uh, uh, and some looks forward at where we think we're going to be. Uh, we're not trying to be as ambitious as to say where we're going to be in 25 years because I don't think anybody knows that or uh, if he or she does, they're probably upstairs at Bloomberg making a, a market play. Uh, but uh, for this session today, we're trying to look five years out and to see where we're going to be. Five years out, as it turns out, is also a bit risky. Um, and again, there would be some people upstairs uh, in the Bloomberg main room making some uh, media plays because it's happening so quickly that, uh, as some of you know, I like to show uh, news articles uh, from just before the forum. So if you'll bear with me for just a moment, I'll just show a few, and then we'll introduce our partners. Uh, this is the USC CCLP page, and you see the webcast at the top. This story ran in the Wall Street Journal on Tuesday, and it's the discovery by advertisers, food, uh, food manufacturers, uh, their advertising teams have discovered that it is far cheaper, $10,000, for example, to do a mobile app for mobile telephones than it is to have a network TV commercial. And guess what? Depending on the audience you're trying to reach, in this case a very young audience, uh, they are using these apps in strength, in numbers, and oh, by the way, if you scroll down, you discover that from their most recent data, 37% of four- and five-year-old children in the United States know how to use an iPhone or a similar smartphone. So they are using their parents, maybe their own, uh, smartphones to, uh, uh, to access games, and in this case, games that are um, uh, in the service of advertising. Um, again, just looking at the present, and this is the present day. We can just extrapolate a year or two out and see where this might go. Uh, again, we're glad to have Olivia Ma uh, with us from YouTube because another media note, most American teenagers now get their music not from radio or television or MTV, but from YouTube. And so think about that. Think back to when FM radio became the medium of choice for music and what that did to AM radio. So YouTube may be the FM radio in many ways of uh, current day. And last, I'll just put up one other article which was in the New York Times this week on the business page, although it was very hard to find online on the future of smartphones. We think we're designing services for iPhone 5 and for the latest uh, Nokia, well maybe not for the latest Nokia, but the latest Android uh, devices. Those are today, and uh, we would be generals in, in effect fighting the last war because the technology is only going to move forward. And um, so with that, I'm going to step down and get some breakfast and invite uh, my uh, longtime friend and partner in these enterprises, uh, Larry Kirkland uh, from American University, who's on sabbatical but is here anyway, uh, to, uh, uh, to come to the podium. Larry. These forums are uh, core to the uh, mission of the School of Communication, helping to define, develop, and demonstrate a robust and inclusive public media culture. Uh, current uh, uh, became a project of the School of Communication in January 2010. Uh, for 30 years, it's been the trade publication for uh, public television and public radio. Uh, now its uh, goal is to make a difference in public media, uh, to play a similar kind of uh, role in this transition in helping to inform and help shape uh, uh, the kinds of discussions we're having today. Uh, Current is uh, reporting on these uh, sessions over the two years, uh, but also doing research and reporting that informs them and uh, uh, develops the case studies and best practices and uh, new insights that uh, will drive the future of public media. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Andrew Lapin is here. Uh, Andrew, uh, uh, reporter from Current. I hope you all get a chance to meet him. Uh, we've been able to uh, uh, develop uh, public uh, 
the public media focus uh, with Current uh, expanding its uh, uh, perspective and uh, uh, developing new resources and tools with support from the Wincoat Foundation. And Feather Houston is here from Wincoat representing uh, uh, their interests. I uh, also want to introduce Mark first, who many of you have talked to. Mark's been uh, uh, serving as Strategic Initiatives uh, Director for Current and has been the prime force in uh, developing uh, these programs. So, Mark, uh, you will have a chance to meet. Uh, Mark has a long history in uh, public media as a senior executive and leader. Uh, began uh, prior to the online work that he's done. Uh, he was general manager of WXPN in Philadelphia. Um, I, I think it's uh, appropriate that we're meeting at uh, ONA. Uh, it really represents the new landscape uh, more than any other journalism conference. And I think uh, the group around the table, uh, uh, to me uh, is indicative of the openness to collaboration and learning from each other. Uh, one of the features of the new environment that we're working in is the willingness uh, of, uh, of uh, traditional nonprofit players to uh, collaborate with uh, commercial players and to have YouTube here uh, around the table to look at the new iFiles, which uh, in addition to uh, all the public uh, media uh, producers includes ABC News and New York Times. Uh, I think is really, really interesting. Uh, tonight as ONA kicks off, uh, Jim Brady, uh, by the way, one of our alums, uh, co uh, chair of uh, ONA uh, and a teacher in our interactive journalism and masters in uh, media entrepreneurship program. Uh, we'll be opening the conference uh, with uh, Kinsey Wilson of uh, NPR. Great to have Kinsey here today. But again, uh, to have uh, 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 so many players who are leading the digital field and helping to define it uh, at the table, uh, I think uh, uh, really gives me a lot of hope for the future of public media. Uh, there are three centers at the School of Communication uh, that uh, I'm representing uh, the Center for Social Media, which has uh, published a report, uh, Public Media 2.0, funded by the Ford Foundation, that I think informs a lot of our discussions. Uh, JLab, the Institute for Interactive Journalism, headed by Jan Schaefer. Uh, Jan will be doing a workshop this afternoon that you should stick your head in on called Entrepreneuring 4.0. Uh, Jan is uh, entrepreneur in residence for our new masters in media entrepreneurship working with Amy Eisman, uh, who uh, heads up that program. Uh, and uh, finally, the Invest Investigative Reporting Workshop headed by Chuck Lewis, uh, which is a partner uh, uh, in iFiles, uh, producer for Frontline, uh, but also is now working on a new series on climate change uh, for Showtime. Uh, so again, uh, very exciting to see uh, uh, the new uh, initiatives and developments that characterize the discussion we're having. Uh, at the core of our discussion is uh, broadening uh, our audiences. And in our first meeting, uh, first forum, uh, we heard from Gary Nell from National Public Radio, who, as he came in, defined uh, a focus and a set of priorities uh, around diversity. He called them the four diversities, uh, race, ethnicity, age, and geography. Uh, and in that discussion, which was largely around sustainability and how uh, uh, stations uh, uh, could uh, find uh, the right economic footing uh, in these difficult times, uh, I think the, the measure of uh, the discussion was that uh, there was uh, mission-driven sustainability, that it wasn't either or, uh, sustainability or mission. And the focus on the diversity uh, goals, I think, was important uh, to uh, shape uh, this series of forums from the beginning. Uh, I think this question of, of engaging audiences uh, uh, 
mapping the assets of communities, uh, empowering communities to solve problems uh, with local talent and capacity uh, is a focus. Uh, I think matching quality content with effective engagement uh, and collaboration among media outlets and allied organizations is key and requires the kind of national coordination we can talk about here today. Uh, the concept of the public sphere, redefining public service media in the digital age, finding a, the wider social purpose uh, is a focus of this discussion. I'm looking forward to it. So thank you for coming. Looking forward to this meeting. Looking forward to how this series develops. Look forward to your input uh, on, on the forum. Thank you. We've done the, uh, 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 the introductions here. Uh, that would take us to Olivia Ma. Hi, everyone. My name is Olivia Ma, um, and I'm the News and Politics Manager at YouTube, where I've been for the last four and a half years. Uh, primarily, I work on well, a range of different news and political projects, but very focused on the U.S. election right now and overseeing our U.S. elections hub. Um, and I'm here really to, to learn and participate um, in this conversation with all of you. I'm really interested in how uh, YouTube is being used as a source of news and information, uh, not just in the U.S., obviously, but around the world. So thanks for having me. I'm Carol Varney. I'm the Managing Director at the Bay Area Video Coalition, more broadly known as BayVac. And we do training of young people and seasoned professionals in the media field, and we're doing a little dabbling right now into more sincere training of especially investigative news reporters. So i um, interested to hear what happens today and sort of spark our interest around what we can do to help. Good morning. My name is Jim Summers. I'm the Senior Vice President of Content at ITVS. I'm really happy to be here with all of you. And um, if you're familiar with ITVS, we produce uh, the largest um, portfolio of independently produced uh, documentary on public television. And uh, we feed several series, including POV and Independent Lens. Uh, I'm here to talk a little bit more about sort of the sustainable conversation. And we launched uh, an initiative called Women and Girls Lead um, that really focuses on gender equality across, you know, many uh, issue areas. And I'm really interested in seeing, having a conversation about how to reach new audiences uh, across many platforms. Thanks. <laughs> and we are launching Half the Sky, the, the New York Times bestseller book, on uh, October 1st and 2nd. Thanks, CPB. <laughs> uh, on many of your PBS stations. <laughs> I'm Vinnie Curran. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at CPB. Uh, Dick McPherson, a Chief Innovator at Next Generation Fundraising, uh, consultant to traditional and newer uh, online uh, public media organizations. Our assignment is basically looking for grassroots support and figuring out how to pay for all this cool stuff. Uh, I'm Robert Rosenthal, the Executive Director of the Center for Investigative Reporting, and I'm here because I'm still trying to figure it out. I'm Steve Goldblum, Marketing and Communications Manager at ITVS, and we're always looking for creative ways to support independent producers and coming up with applications to support stations, so I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Hi, I'm Peggy Miles, Intervox Communications in Washington, D.C., and we do digital media strategy integration and hopefully business model validation and analysis. And it's all about reaching more people. And I'm delighted to be with this group. Thank you. I'm Bill Davis from Southern California Public Radio. I'm uh, the resident guy who sees the uh, black cloud behind every silver lining. Uh, my two mantras are that uh, public media is fatally comfortable and we need to become productively paranoid. I'm Ginny Burson. I'm the Vice President of the National Federation of Community Broadcasters. Um, among our 250 member stations, about 50% are rural and are frequently the only providers of local news and information programming. Um, about 50% of our members, and there's some overlap there, are so-called minority stations that are uh, and they're all, all of our stations are, we are trying to help them transition into a multi-platform world not just be radio stations. Okay, I'm Sandy Evans. I'm a PhD candidate at USC, Berg School for Communication. I'm doing research on innovation in public media organizations, particularly with a focus on digital strategies. 
Hi, I'm Michael Scholar. I'm Vice President of Interactive for Public Radio International. We have 27 producers, uh, 27 shows that we distribute, um, a range of producers that we work with, and um, our goal is really to help people engage with the world and the diversity of the world. And so I'm anxious to hear what's going on elsewhere and to share what we're doing. Hi, I'm Deanna Mackey. I'm the station manager at KPBS in San Diego. And we're particularly interested right now in monetizing content through mobile. So I'm curious about hearing about that. Hi, I'm Chris Satulo. I'm Vice President for News and Civic Dialogue at WHYY in Philadelphia. And Bill, I live in a state of perfected paranoia. So. Good morning, all. I'm Bruce Kuhn, the News Director at KQD Public Radio. Um, I'm also one of those wearing the hats that um, Rich mentioned earlier about being an early um, president of the Online News Association. And, you know, our second conference ever was at the Claremont Hotel um, across the bay in Berkeley at a time when we didn't know if anybody would show up, uh, in particular because it uh, one month before the conference, 9-11 happened. And as you know, there were a lot of conferences and a lot of questions, and we thought, oh, my gosh. And there was just enough time between that event and what always happens in the news world Journalists want to meet and come together to uh, discuss and, and share. And this enormous amount of crowd showed up, and uh, we were off and running. I'm um, a longtime Bay Area person, and I'm glad that we're here so I could welcome to you to my home city. I'm Kinsey Wilson. I oversee news, music, uh, programming, and digital at NPR. Uh, probably worth thing, I'm also one of the ex-ONA presidents. Uh, probably worth mentioning that I, I believe it's accurate to say that ONA is now by far the largest journalism conference uh, and has eclipsed ASNE as sort of the, the go-to event, which is, speaks to what's going on. Um, in terms of why we're here, um, we thought we had it all figured out. Like Rosie, we've discovered that we got to figure it out all over again. So, I'm Davia Nelson. I'm half of the Kitchen Sisters. We produce stories that are on national public radio. And I'm here representing AIR, the Association of Independence in Radio, which is an organization I'm sure everyone's familiar with, but 863 members, 46 states represented, 23 countries. We recently found out that only 9% of the radio producers are only producing radio. Right now, everyone's working in every medium, which I think speaks to the heart of this event right now. Uh, the Kitchen Sisters are currently working on a project called Localore, which CPB has funded and WinCode has also been behind. And uh, it's an experiment in public radio, 10 independent producers collaborating with 10 stations. We're in collaboration with KQED. We launch our series uh, this coming week, The Making of what people make in the Bay Area and why. And this is a project that's engaged on all levels of media, trying to have radio as a source, but stemming out from there into a variety of platforms. So this is appropriate. Uh, my name is Steve Engelberg. I'm the managing editor of ProPublica, the national investigative news organization. Um, and as of January 1, uh, I will have the uh, daunting task of filling Paul Steiger's rather large uh, shoes as editor-in-chief, and I'm eager to uh, collect any and all ideas on how one might do that. Hi, I'm Brant Houston. I'm the night chair in investigative reporting at the University of Illinois, but I'm here representing the Investigative News Network, which is a consortium of about 65 uh, independent nonprofit uh, organizations that produce investigative work. And I'm very interested in looking at the partnerships that are already developing between public media and these centers. And I see a great future in that partnership. So I'll be interested to hear what others have to say about it. Thanks. I'm Judy Muller, and this is loud. Um, I'm a professor of broadcast journalism at USC's Annenberg School, formerly ABC News correspondent, commentator for NPR's Morning Edition, um, now I'm a commentator for Marketplace Money doing something called Senior Moment, something I figure I can't age out of. At any rate, um, I'm here primarily as an educator because obviously, like other journalism schools, we're very eager to keep not just abreast but ahead uh, so that we can prepare young journalists um, to be adaptive and maintain critical thinking skills. And uh, even as they're juggling back and forth between platforms, um, to maintain the standards of our profession. So that's why I'm here. 
My name is Emil Guillermo, and if you saw the, the list and you saw that I'm identified as a former host of All Things Considered, that was 20-some years ago. I have done other things since then. Uh, I guess I'm here to attest that. I'm kind of surprised to be here, although maybe I owe Adam a favor or something. Uh, but I'm, pl I'm pleased to be here because uh, when I was the host of All Things Considered, I think I was the first non-white host and we talked about this thing called diversity back then, like it would, like it had arrived. Uh, well, it, I guess it really hasn't, and to the extent that we thought. I spent most of my life in journalism since then, really devoted to diversity, and I'd like to share some of the things I, I do, uh, writing for things like the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund and, and the ethnic media. And I think I'm part of the audience we want to attract, but I'm not sure. We'll find out. I'm Linda Fanton. I am the Director of Network Journalism Innovation at American Public Media, and in that role I have the pleasure of overseeing the Public Insight Network, which is a collective, if you will, of about 170,000 citizen sources and about 80 newsrooms around the country who tap those folks for insight and knowledge to help make their journalism deeper and more diverse and more relevant. Um, a grateful partner to many of you around the table and other um, and, and, uh, and many of your colleagues and also a grateful recipient of CPB funding that's really helped to keep uh, public, the public insight engine alive. And I'm here because I'd like to see how we can continue to make collaboration an engine for better journalism. And after spending 20 years in print, I can say I'm very happy to be in the public media universe because I think this is where the innovation is happening. And those who have their tent cards on the back of their chairs. Uh, Feather Houston, I'm with, I work with David Hawes at the Wincote Foundation. We have a both national and regional a portfolio of projects that um, are supporting, I, I like to think about it as the sort of the intersection between uh, legacy public media and the innovation that's happening in, in new media. I'm Don Henry. I guess I'm sitting in the Philadelphia section. Um, I'm with uh, WHYY. I'm the director of digital news for NewsWorks. And I guess if you reduce it to what my son would call my origin story, the reason I'm here is um, about 15 years ago, I was the only guy in the newsroom who could set up the email for one of the senior executives. I'm Elizabeth Fiedler. I'm a reporter uh, with WHYY in Philadelphia. I have the pleasure of working with Chris and Don almost every day. And I'll sort of navigate the three ONA former presidents here who are sitting together <laughs> and come to the other side. Uh, I'm Andrew Lapin. I'm an assistant editor with Current Newspaper. And now that we've uh, uh, met everyone around the table, uh, let's plunge in. And I'm going to give you just a sense of the arc of the conversation so far, um, which is very much focused on uh, inside public broadcasting. So there, we have a lot of people from outside. You'll have a few insights here. What are we going to try to do today? I, I thought as we were going around the room that it's probably a group double or triple the size, but not much larger than that, that is, uh, if you look at one of these 80-20 proportions, is, is controlling or affecting about 80 percent of the, the potential impact we could have through digital media and news. And I think this discussion is very much focused, and I hope it will be on news and public affairs and digital media. One of the reasons for that is all the time I was working at IMA, <clears throat> the Integrated Media Association, which represents a lot of these groups, <clears throat> the tracking study at the Pew Center for Internet and American Life showed that the top three things people did online was, one, go online, two, do email, and the third thing was, quote, get news. It has been the third most common thing that people do online since the beginning of tracking the Internet. <laughs> um, the group here has a lot of lessons and insights and vision. It's one of the reasons that I put Kinsey right at the front of, the, of here. The vision that we project 
to our colleagues will definitely affect the trajectory uh, and success of public media's efforts in the digital sphere. I see largely this is an effort for us to get to know one another. There is some kind of an informal network that operates in almost every important industry. This one already exists, but I want to, wanted to use this working with Adam and his staff and the people at American University to reinforce that network. <clears throat> um, our aim is not to do something new. Our aim is basically to reinforce existing efforts. Current, Annenberg, AU are not really set up to just start new things and, and launch them. Our work is to reinforce efforts that are coming, that you're already part of. <clears throat> and nothing is going to happen of a big scale because of whatever is said today. Any change effort, any development effort, development effort is a multi-year operation. <clears throat> um, I'm trying to follow the rule that Steve Barron set for me, which was don't just have another discussion that doesn't go anywhere. So I'll be working with all of you after this to try to find ways to take what we do here and move it. <clears throat> This is a little bit of a map of what public media looks like <clears throat> um, if, if you take a, an insider view. You start with an inside core of the organizations within public broadcasting, and there's really now a very, very large number of operations. Jan Schaefer at JLab tracks 2,000 online digital groups. But this group here is a very big part of all of the most powerful parts of this. <clears throat> And I'm going to speak br briefly about the business side of how public broadcasting is working right now, where it's going, what is affecting its ability to do things. <clears throat> the first session we held in Washington talked about the fact that there are two separate parts of public broadcasting, one of which is doing pretty well, one of which is doing pretty poorly. <clears throat> They're called radio and television. <clears throat> okay? And... Um, <clears throat> One has been in decline for a long time. If you use membership, and almost every group in here that's trying to find a business model is looking to translate their content into some relationship with a, with a user base that will reward them with financial support. Sometimes it's major donors, sometimes it's a grassroots thing, but almost everybody wants this kind of relationship. We're doing something important in news, you recognize it, give us some money so we can keep doing it. It's working better in ra radio than television, and it has been for a while. <clears throat> There's a 37% drop in the members to public television in the United States over the period of time we see on the graph. <clears throat> Business support is even more dramatic. <clears throat> in radio, over the last decade and a half, it's gone up by more than $100 million, and it's dropped by $200 million in television. Part of this graph is a reflection of the fact that major programs are developed at stations in public television. So the loss of Exxon support for Masterpiece Theater appears as a station loss. This doesn't count the money coming into NPR. But again, you can see these two, um, these two tracks that are out there. Has television gotten past this very difficult period? Why is it still probably going to survive, probably going to, going to continue to be an important part of public media? It's because of the introduction of more and more philanthropic money. And the reason I'm raising this issue is almost everybody in this room who's operating in the nonprofit sphere doing public media is operating on philanthropic support, not what I would call earned income, which is underwriting, advertising, or I'm doing something, give me some money for doing it. <clears throat> this is, there has been in television a growth of almost a um, hundred and... $40 million in financial support from philanthropists or money invested in endowments that are paying back to the stations that support their work. <clears throat> it's netted out the losses that they've had from their losses in membership and their losses in underwriting that I showed you in a previous slide. <clears throat> they suffered not only losses because their membership was dropping in business support, but their endowment shrunk. If you have a 401k, you know the feeling back in um, 2009. <clears throat> It's changed the business model of public broadcasting in such a way that on the television side, these two parts, the sort of earned income side and the philanthropic side, are almost of equal importance now to the maintenance of that system. CBD support has increased as a percentage of all dollars flowing into stations, unadjusted for inflation, over this period of time. <clears throat> the radio side is very different. And, this, and most of our feeling that public media is going to have a big impact in news is coming from... Kinsey and his staff at NPR, the stations that are represented in this room, a large group of people who did not experience the losses that I was showing before. In fact, they had a synergistic, positive thing happen to them over the last decade where they were growing 
membership underwriting and philanthropic support at the same time. <clears throat> Here's the top 25 stations in their growth against 2001. They've added $100 million in support. And I just finished one of these sessions in Seattle where the top fundraisers in the United States told me they thought there were at least two areas where we would have additional increases of $100 million a year over the next 10 years, major gifts and improvements in membership support. <clears throat> um, in television, the money has basically netted out the losses. In radio, it's, um, it's provided strength. And you can see there's significant growth, again, in philanthropic income on both sides. And the ability of people in this room to be able to move forward is probably going to rest in large part on accessing these philanthropic dollars because there is no business model for digital media that people have been able to develop for these new news properties. I think everybody knows that. <clears throat> but public radio is fairly well positioned. It's, it's got a large and growing audience. It's got a position where it's able to access several uh, pieces of revenue that are going to sustain it in the years ahead. And here's what people saw as the real opportunities of the next decade, major giving at the top of the list. Um, this is why I'm putting Kinsey at the top of, of this uh, list of speakers in, in our discussion. NPR and the radio side, it's access to uh, a large audience. And I'm going to just make reference back to the first slide. Is public media an important part of the American landscape? The figures that CPB and others put out, we reach 170 million people a week in the United States. It's already very large. It is fragmented, it is relatively inefficient, and it's going through a very difficult transition to something new. But at least this part of it, the radio-based part of the public media thing aimed at news, probably has some pretty strong a footing in which to approach this. And Kinsey, I'm going to now turn it over to you and you take it from there. Uh, thank you, Mark. I'm going to talk about uh, sort of our vision for where radio is headed, and at the tail end of that, talk a little bit about the economics, and we can get into it more deeply in the, in the conversation. But I want to give you at least a sense of sort of the trajectory. Um, hopefully it is, is relevant to you beyond just radio itself. Uh, I was looking around the room. There are at least a dozen folks here who are partners of, in one sense or another, both uh, internal to public radio and, and outside. Um, and as Mark alluded to, our business model has, is one that uh, startups in particular seem to covet uh, from the inside. It's, it doesn't always look quite as attractive as it might from the outside, but uh, hopefully some of the things we're thinking about there will be relevant. In my new position, I've been overseeing the news division uh, as well as digital since March, uh, part of my responsibility is really to sort of, if you will, manage the crossfade between over-the-air broadcasting um, and digital. Um, one of the things that I think we have going for us is the fact that radio, unlike almost every other form of media, has been remarkably durable and stable uh, during this period of 16, 17 years since the advent of the commercial internet. The um, number of people who are tuning in in any given week has remained uh, incredibly stable, and NPR's audience has increased. Uh, about 60% in the last 10 years or so during that period. Through some combination of uh, station acquisition, changes in format, um, improvements in our news coverage, improvements in local coverage, and so forth. It's, it's a variety of things. But it has uh, given us a little bit of added runway that newspapers and, to some extent, television have not enjoyed in the same way. Um, we've also done uh, – this is a – somewhat dated slide that goes only to 08, but have done relatively well compared to other media. Um, at the same time that that's been happening, our digital audience has been growing significantly. Uh, this is just a, a reflection of NPR's digital audience. Uh, it does not count any of the station, roughly 1,000 station streams that are out there. We are getting those under measurement now. Uh, we'll have those, we'll have numbers for that by the end of the year and expect to be in somewhere in that top five with Clear Channel and Pandora and Cats Media and a few others in terms of uh, the total number of, of visitors that are coming to us over digital streams. The bigger story here, other than just the doubling in the last two years of, of our overall growth, is that it, mobile has gone from 2% to nearly a quarter of our traffic in, in just two years. And it would not surprise me to see it become 
fully half of our traffic in another couple of years. You're seeing it reflected in the um, beginning, perhaps, of a hockey stick in the number of people who are actually listening online now. It's increased 33 percent in each of the last two years. Uh, you see it in projections of what Pandora's total listener hours are likely to be by uh, 2016, by one estimate. Uh, whether Pandora gets there or not, we could debate, but it's indicative at least uh, of where online listening is going. The other thing that's occurring that um, I think everybody is very much aware of, but which has not directly affected radio yet, is this way in which people are being conditioned to consume media. Um, Google did a study recently that, that really kind of drilled in on the fact that we've gone now from individual screens being largely dedicated to particular purposes to people simply skating across a wide variety of screens depending on location, convenience, a variety of other factors. Um, and so being able to track that and provide a seamless experience across all of those uh, becomes an integral part of what the media experience has to be. It obviously is becoming more personal as people are willing to log in and personalize. Uh, you can track activity and thus give better and better recommendations. It is, of course, on demand. It's increasingly social. Um, and because mobile is inherently uh, location aware, the ability to present information to people uh, based on their location is essential. None of this is, is anything that public radio generally has had to grapple with up to now, except in the slightest of ways, but is going to become, uh, as listening moves to mobile, an absolutely essential part of what we do. Um, so where are we focused? Um, I talk internally about simply having to think about producing for six screens. I include over-the-air terrestrial radio as one of those. Uh, internet connected cars is another, tablets, smartphones, uh, the laptop, desktop, uh, and the big screen TV. Most of those are mobile or have the potential to be mobile, perhaps with the exception of the big screen TV. Um, we have been over the last several years in a position almost of developing uh, media in two directions, doing radio on the one hand and learning how to do text and pictures and in some ways producing a newspaper-like site over here, those things are going to merge uh, very, very quickly. And we're saying we're going to lead with audio. That's our core. That's our strength. Uh, that's what uniquely differentiates us. Uh, that doesn't mean that we don't have to be uh, incredibly versatile and understand uh, video and text and pictures and understand how to put it together. But now we're in a position to merge those and make a determination platform by platform uh, where we best deploy those. We will win by continuing to produce great content that stands out and minimizing the sort of commodity news that we do. Um, but we also have to combine it with great user experience. Um, the, maybe the most dramatic example I think of is, is how effectively Flipboard was able to take things that were simply out there in the form of uh, Facebook news feeds and RSS feeds and so forth and put it together in a really compelling experience. If we can't do that, um, we will be uh, largely dependent on others who aggregate our content, and we will likely lose the connection to membership that Mark was talking about that's so essential. So being able to combine technology with content is now, I think, part of our core. Um, we also have to learn to develop multi-channel programming. We have been in a linear world that was clock-bound, and it no longer is, and so we're getting into a world of having a multitude of different channels running simultaneously. Um, it requires partnership on both the content and the technology side, relentless partnership. Uh, it means building a network among public radio stations. Uh, we have been pushing for four years to uh, work with member stations to encourage them, support them in strengthening their local journalism because at the end of the day that's what's going to keep them relevant in this world, and we think we are stronger as a network than uh, if we simply try to go it alone, if that were even an option. Um, we have to drive economies of scale. Mark referred to the inefficiencies in, in public radio, um, particularly in the digital space. The idea that we can all build uh, each of these capabilities uh, will quickly overextend us and bankrupt us. Um, and finally, we have to figure out ways to extend 
the economics of public radio. It's my contention that the business model for public radio doesn't change. Um, its strength is its diversity and the fact that we rely on a variety of different sources of revenue. Um, and we need to be able to figure out how to translate those into the digital space. Uh, probably the most critical is listener support. It is nobody else has figured out how to convince people to voluntarily give uh, to support their news gathering in the kind of substantial way that public radio has over the last 40 years or so. Roughly 10 percent of the audience is, is contributing on a regular basis. We're showing that with sustaining giving, people doing credit card renewal, auto credit card renewals, as opposed to constant pledge drives, you can drive those numbers up. Um, I wasn't aware of it, but you mentioned the upside opportunity on this. We just had uh, the Boston Consulting Group did a pro bono uh, engagement with us. Among the things they identified is they said they think we could uh, double the amount of individual donation in sheer dollar terms. Uh, relatively quickly if we can take advantage of digital platforms so that people will be more inclined to give if you provide added convenience, added personalization, and ability to, to really make it an even more intimate part of your media experience. But as, as most of you can surely imagine, the infrastructure underlying that, not to mention the politics of that, are immensely complicated. Um, we also think that there is, we, we have been remarkably inefficient in major gift um, philanthropy, and there are opportunities to collaborate much more effectively on that and drive that as well. What does this look like as it starts to come together? Uh, a couple of things that are already out there. We're in the Ford Sync. We, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about it yet. We have another announcement either has been made or is about to be made with another auto company it's a day now. Uh, expect another two to be online by CES in January. Um, bringing together public radio content in an environment like this that is designed to be localized. Um, I mean, the way that our connected car apps work, it, you know, it's a one touch experience. It figures out where the car is. It figures out how many public radio stations with a signal strength of three are within the vicinity of that car. It does a lookup to see how much money they pay us as a proxy for audience. Uh, and then it defaults to them, or if you have them preset, it defaults to the preset. If not, it defaults to them based on their audience share and goes into our newscast. It, it actually says you're listening to KQD San Francisco and then goes into our newscast. And if we have their local newscast, it pulls that in next behind it, goes into the stream. So we're experimenting with ways to, even as we present content nationally, to localize it. Uh, another example that's out there, this is not a product per se, this is uh, very much an alpha uh, experiment that's in the Google Chrome store and only works in Chrome uh, on the desktop, and that is the Infinite Player, where we were experimenting with a one-touch experience. Again, localized, shareable, um, includes uh, more like this, less like this, skip functionality, and the beginning of what I was describing as kind of this multi-channel environment where we're not simply presenting a, a single news stream, but a whole variety of different things and it can be expanded significantly from there. So that's a taste. I, I wouldn't say that these are, you should take these as uh, finished examples of where we're headed, but they're uh, early indications of the kinds of things we're starting to work with and we'll be pushing on much more uh, in the days ahead. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you very much, and you can see why uh, we asked Kinsey to go first, because uh, not just because so many people around the room are NPR member stations, but that NPR is dealing and uh, dealing uh, with uh, a high degree of success with the issues which we are all uh, going to be discussing today and facing in the months and years to come. This is very much a conversation, as, uh, uh, as uh, promised. And so uh, questions, comments, uh, Bruce. Um, yes, I, I'm actually cheating. I'm going to steal something from mine so I, have, I can get within my 10 minutes. Uh, but I wanted to put out here, and I know Chris and I were just talking about this yesterday. If this is a conversation about the opportunities on public media, especially on public radio, that Mark outlined, um, I want to reference Bill Davis's comment about paranoia. 
One of the issues I hope is discussed or it has to be admitted that, and this is from the perspective of someone who just joined public media five years ago, is as we talk about news and public affairs and the capacity, we have to examine the fact that public radio, public television has very little capacity for doing news and public affairs. We have a great NPR organization. We have a half dozen or a dozen big market stations where there are actually newsrooms. But the fact of the matter is, if we examine the network itself, uh, the history of it is in other areas, good areas of programming regarding music, arts. But the news capacity is very, very low at this opportunity. And uh, Kinsey referenced trying to create a network. I was one of your editors was in this week, and uh, we, he was lamenting that to build a network, I need to have newsrooms around the country. And he says, I don't know how many stations I've gone to. And the news director is the former classical music critic who said, I've been asked to kind of give this news thing a try. And it's, it's not a criticism of what they accomplished, but I think it's a reality that public media needs to uh, address and look at in regards to this opportunity that we're talking about. And we're not even talking about the digital space. We're just talking about basic investment and in things into, into that. Um, I, I, I follow up on that. And I think what you looked at was the substance of the public media newsrooms. I think the concern that I have is the essence of public media newsrooms. Uh, you know, as good as a lot of the material that we've done in the past is, the fundamental approach of public media has been to do the news a day late and call it analysis. And, you know, we break some news every once in a while, but it is not a core strength at any public media institution aside. You know, there, there are a couple that you might make, make, make exceptions for. And the culture of public media is generally a production culture. It is get the show out, get the piece out, get the movie out. It's a production culture, not a news culture. And we're going to have to wrestle that to the ground if we are going to be an essential part of a news ecology, either at a local level or a national level. So I just have to jump in for a second uh, with, to ask you to repeat a, uh, a piece of information that you shared in the April meeting in Los Angeles, which is how large is your newsroom at KPCC? Uh, we're just passing 100 now. That's atypical. It is atypical. Um, but and, and let, me, let me add, it reflects on, the, on the, my presentation. This enormous expansion of resources within public broadcasting is occurring almost entirely within about 25 stations in radio and television. It, 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 almost all of the real big growth is concentrated in large market stations or state networks. And Bills is one of the fastest growing stations in the country. So this expansion that you're referring to, Bruce, it, I think is occurring but it's occurring in only in a limited number of places. And I want to get some reaction from other people. Go ahead. Uh, Brent, Brent, Brent yeah. has the mic. Yeah. Probably not. I'm here. Hello? Okay. Try this one. I think we have an incredible opportunity right now. Um, there's been a tremendous expansion of small and medium-sized independent news centers that produce a lot of news, including investigative work. But I want to emphasize there's across the board. Um, there's a ready team of, of news people throughout the country. They're already naturally uh, collaborating with uh, NPR stations, in some cases PBS. In fact, they're actually now, you could use the word, embedded in the stations. So there's a lot of the wheel that doesn't need to be reinvented. It's more what needs to be invented is the collaboration and how fundraising can sustain these groups. Uh, Seattle, San Diego, um, I think uh, Denver, uh, all over the country you have these groups moving in or working very closely with NPR. I, I have a small news project in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. Uh, we now have desk in the NPR PBS station. So I think there's a way to work this out and to cut through um, a lot of procedure if we can find the funding for it. Raise your hand if you want to go next. Uh, okay, Aunt Judy and Stephen. Yeah, Judy Muller uh, from Annenberg. I'm going to disagree with you, Bill. I, I think that uh, public television, public radio, breaking news all the time. And I, I report for KCET once with PBS, no longer, um, and we have broken a number of stories that got laws changed 
in California. So, and I hear it on, on public radio all the time. So, and you can't analyze an event until it's happened. So I think the next day analysis is going to be with us for a while. But, um, but what, and you and I have talked about this, how do you get uh, donors and people interested in investigative reporting, how do you get them to fund it? And I think that's the crux of the problem, and I don't think we sell it well enough. I don't think we do, and I think that's where we have to, to go. Let's go to Stephen. On this side? Robert, you go next. Uh, well, you, just to add to what uh, Brent was saying, I mean, I, I think, yes, it's absolutely true that public radio breaks stories, but I think the production culture works against um, the investment of sort of the mega amounts of time that certain kinds of things take. And, and we do, I think, have a historic opportunity here. People like, uh, like us and others in, in the space right now um, are awash with content um, and looking for ways to get it out to a larger audience and looking for a more sustainable funding model. And at least speaking for ProPublica, um, it has been, um, I, I think, just from a content side, fascinating and, and very inspiring to see how well complicated stories seem to translate to radio. I don't think it's a coincidence that that radio graph isn't falling. I think there is actually, even in this uh, digital age where you can get anything you want, any video you want, I think there remains something magical about radio um, which works well with complex stories. So I, I think this is a, a marriage that could work well on a number of uh, different levels. Robert? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the first things I did when I got to CIR uh, four and a half years ago when we had seven people and uh, we're really struggling, it was unclear how long we'd survive, is I went to KQED and I had about $40,000 and I went to, I think I don't know if I started with Bruce or John, whoever was there, and I said, can we, I really want to have a radio, one of your good radio reporters completely embedded in everything we're doing and let's split the costs, you know, and we basically split salary and costs. And Michael Montgomery has done incredible work, and it, it, it works. And I think what's really going to have to happen going forward, uh, and I'm in discussions with nearly everybody who's in radio in this room, but what we need, I don't want to recreate what you guys know how to do. We have the information, we have the content, and we want to tell it on every platform. And that's what Steve's doing and Brant's talking about. So it's actually happening. And it's really what's, and we're actually in joint fundraising right now with KQED, uh, with donors, donors who supported both of us. So I think from my perspective, what I see is a fear in public radio when I talk to them about us maybe stealing their funders, because we have joint funders. And so either we have to collaborate on the funding and understand that it's going to benefit both of us, and make really clear to the funders and the foundations that central to what we're doing are these partnerships. And the goal for us, we see we're not a destination website. We're a, we're a high-quality content producer on all platforms. And I see a lot more innovation and risk-taking at our end. And, uh, you know, we've basically, uh, <laughs> if I think about the last four years, I had no idea where we were going. You have to respond com completely now and be really not only reactive, but really seize the opportunities. So I think there's a lot of willingness from the INN, from ProPublica, from CPI, from us and others to really work together. But what we need, we don't want to recreate what we do. We have information. We need to share producers. We're completely open in the culture we've created to let who radio people in and be, have access to everything we're doing. And what we say, you choose what you want to do. You understand that medium. We're not going to tell you what to do. We're not going to... Uh, impose a print journalist values on a radio story and audio platform. And I think that evolving culture in these new organizations is really you have to recreate the environment or create an environment where the collaboration, the respect for the other platforms is imbued in everybody. And it's, it's not a pipe dream. It's actually happening. I'm going to ask Deanna, you, you have done a great job developing the financial resources around your news operations. Give us your comment on what you've heard so far in terms of the ability to access more financial support for the kinds of things that you're doing. Are, are there models that transcend some of the barriers that we've, we've been talking about? I think so. I'd actually like to follow up on Robert first because we have a partnership with Investigative News Source, which is a nonprofit that does data driven journalism. They're in our building. We've also done um, joint fundraising. We recently got a several hundred thousand dollar joint grant to bring in a reporter producer on our team that basically does the 
coordination of the content that they're taking from the research that's done by the INS um, researcher. So it's a great partnership. We've been able to build our investigative team to seven through the partnership with INS and ourselves. So I would highly recommend that kind of um, embedding and so on. Um, as far as fundraising, we've had a lot of success, and I think some of this was discussed by my colleagues at the LA meeting with um, funding BEATS. Uh, we have about, I believe, 12 people who are funded by donors or foundations, and we essentially go out and talk about um, the topic areas that we're going to be covering in a thematic area like environment, business, so on. And some of them are funded by one person or one organization. Some of the funds, there might be three funding a particular desk. And it's open not just to a reporter. Um, we have videographers funded. We have web producers funded that way as well. Um, so we found that opening up that idea of funding a desk and not just through one source, it can be a donor, it can be a foundation, it can be a corporation, um, has been successful. We do three-year um, agreements. So if you want to fund a desk, uh, it has to be for a minimum of three years, uh, salary, uh, benefits, and some operating expenses. And if I could ask that, P.S. notice that she said videographer uh, at the Robert F. Kennedy Awards uh, when I was running NPR News. We were pleased to get a Robert F. Kennedy Award for radio this year at the Robert F. Kennedy Awards. One of the awards NPR won was for photography. Very interesting. Linda. Adam, you, I mean, you, the question about models. I don't know if this is a model, but I think it's a great example of what can happen when you have a foundation of a collaborative network. So obviously, um, you know, Rosie, Steve, you know, your shops have been doing distributive journalism reporting for quite a while. So recently, Rosie's team got a hold of some data and analyzed data on veterans and the waits times for them to receive benefits. So they, you know, put that in a map form, put it out there to the Public Insight Network newsrooms and said, here's the data, use it, do reporting. Of course, except for those top stations, they don't have the reporting resources to do it. So our Public Insight crack reporting team, which, ex you know, consists of, you know, a national radio producer, um, uh, an online editor, a couple of reporters, we took the data and we did newsers for smaller stations like KJZZ and Indianapolis. So we produced the actual news piece that they ran on the air. And it was brief, but it was localized. So it was, you know, content of national interest, but local relevance. For, K, for KUOW in Seattle, they wanted the overview piece. So we did an overview piece for them. So the idea was super serving those stations with the actual content. But the best part is, is that to Bill's point, um, I think we can't forget the importance of engagement in the public media space and how we could learn to trade more off of that. Um, newsrooms may not have a lot of reporters, but they have great convening powers. They're used to doing that. So along with these stories, these stations then do call-outs that link to queries that local vets and sources then write in and tell their stories, and they can use that as user-generated content and, cont and start to provide more value to their audience. Um, I don't know that it's a model, but I'd like to see where we could take something like that. Bruce again. Um, I wanted to ask Deanna, because I, I think what they're doing at KPBS is terrific. And to the point of changes in the culture or the setup, you mentioned that each beat is a three-year grant. So what happens when the grant ends? Because I think there's a lot of discussion of how we have to begin getting away from that um, cycle because we create a service, the audience loves it, the, the beat, the grant ends, but the need and the, and the audience we've built for that service remains. So I'd love to hear what others are, how they're addressing that. Maybe uh, you should be the first to respond, and I have Bill Davis. Has it's a great question and was something we worry about all the time. Uh, what we have done is when we get to a place where we aren't sure if our, the growth and the rest of our um, revenue um, will be able to sustain the positions if we don't get um, renewals on those three-year grants, then we hold steady 
for a while in that particular area. So we don't, basically we don't allow ourselves to overgrow. Now we've been very successful at renewing um, the majority of the funds and if a particular organization or individual hasn't wanted to renew, we've been able to find uh, somebody else to step in in most cases. But we will go through periods where we'll say this is what we can handle right now. And there's constant push on the, um, the more legacy funding areas of the station like membership and corporate support and so on to ensure that we can, after the three years, if the funding isn't there, we can actually fund the person through our operating budget or the desk. And it's not just at local stations. Kinsey, I don't know if it's still the case, but when I was running NPR News, we got a grant for one year for a reporter for Latin America, and then what do you do? Mm -hmm. uh, specifically, Bruce, to yours, while we're doing the fundraising around verticals, beats, desk, whatever term you want to use, uh, we also have a, uh, an effort going on to double our membership base. And um, we've mapped it out pretty clearly that we have about 55,000 members currently. For us to sustain the growth in the newsroom four years out, we'll need to be at just under 100,000. And, and, and our, our operating assumption is that those grants are not going to be renewed. Uh, a a three-year grant is a pretty long uh, commitment to get from either an individual or a foundation. And so uh, that puts a lot of pressure on the membership but I really think if you're looking to try to create a sustainable model that the membership uh, growth, the membership base growth is really the only one that's going to make it uh, sustainable. Quick response from Kinsey. Um, so two quick remarks. Um, I mean, related to that, it's not just investment in particular subject matter areas, um, but we're finding increasingly that donors want to in, uh, fund innovation. And, and that simply requires additional headcount on a, in a variety of areas, and it's, we're tending to see money moving into those areas and away from the core. Um, and yet we've got to sustain, you know, the innovation doesn't matter if we can't sustain the news gathering force that we have in the first place. And so it is creating uh, tensions that we're all going to have to manage. Going back to Bill and, and Bruce's original point about sort of a, a production culture, I think one of the really valuable parts of the kind of uh, partnerships that we've done with Rosie and with Steve and, and others um, is um, not simply in the content itself and um, the, the potential for joint fundraising, but also in the potential uh, cultural uh, change that it can bring to our organization. These are production-oriented organizations. Those of us who have come out of newspapers, I think one of the surprises to me certainly was the weakest part of public radio is in the editing ranks, which you almost take for granted in the newspaper, right? That solid core of middle-ranking editors who help with assignments and do close-in story editing just doesn't exist in public radio. And so that's another place where I think collaboration can be really important because we need to build that muscle. Yeah, I just want to build on what um, Kinsey presented earlier because I think this is a lot about the culture of collaboration and how you adapt across production cultures. Um, and we, we had conversations about a year ago with PRI about how do you move, you know, independent TV producers into the world of, the, of radio producers. So it's, so it's a, a collaborative production environment and not just one sort of promoting the other. And I think that's a, it's really hard to do. But I sort of wanted to build off of your comment about content and technology and the user experience and what the user really wants from from that collaboration um, is, is that seamless experience. And I, th through um, additional support from CPB, we've been building a, a, a product. You know, it's called the Online Video Engagement Experience. And, and it's really about trying to bring in both video and radio and new forms of engagement in a social TV environment. And I, I'm really curious about that when I see, I know that the, the example that you gave um, was a, an example of I, I think you said it's for the car or for, for an automobile, which may not have a video component. <laughs> maybe, maybe it will, who knows. But um, I am curious about just creating the technology in which users, this is what they want, and the experience is one in which they're pulling together sort of the various platforms in the digital environment. And they're not thinking about sort of our issues at all, <laughs> about how that's being produced. Um, and so exploring the user experience as much as we're sort of exploring our own collaborative environment of how we're actually going to get this and sustain our own work. Um, just curious about other people's ideas about that. 
Many of you know uh, Bill Kling, one of the, the pioneers uh, in public radio, who built Minnesota into a, a tremendously powerful, uh, Michael Scholar turning around now, uh, into a tremendously powerful organization, and of course, uh, American Public Radio. And he used to talk about the next significant jerk. Uh, and uh, the first time I heard him say this was 20 some odd years ago, and he said, Garrison Keillor was a significant jerk, meaning he jerked the audience up. And he said, Scott Simon was a significant jerk, jerked the audience up. Morning edition, jerked the audience up. Look in your slides, 2008 election, jerks the audience up. 2009-11, jerks the audience up. How could that translate into the kinds of things we're talking about that stations and partners can do? I think that's um, a halfway decent segue into what Chris Satulo is going to talk about. That works very well, thank you. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I just learned this morning I'd be following Kinsey, which is always intimidating. I love hearing Kinsey talk about his vision for NPR, but as someone at a member station, I never know whether I'm listening to Moses talk about the Promised Land or Darth Vader arriving with the Battlestar. <laughs> it's always a question we have, Kinsey. But I'm going to assume for the sake of this event that you're Moses. Also, um, this is our website for news and civic dialogue in Philly Newsworks. And I'm overcome with a desire to ask my colleague Don Henry to go fix whatever's going on with that ad in the right hand corner right now. So, anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, Newsworks uh, was launched in November of 2010. Um, its goal, as we've been able to refine it after launch, we launched it uh, in uh, kind of a flop sweat hurry because we had a very generous grant from Vinny and the rest of the good folks at CPB. And they're funny about wanting to have the deliverable by the end of the grant, and the deliverable was launching the website, so we did, um, and then figured out um, by experimenting and trying stuff what we're doing. We're attempting um, to become one of the, there's no such thing as an indispensable source of news in a local news environment, but we believe that the most civically engaged people in our region and probably in your region too are probably relying every day on three or four sources. However, whatever screen and whatever way um, they're accessing, there are three or four most trusted sources that tell them what's going on in their community. We want to be one of them um, for Everyone in our region, which stretches from the state of Delaware across the Philadelphia region to South Jersey, um, we want to be um, a relied upon, trusted source of news and conversation for digitally savvy, civically connected people who believe in the future of our region, um, think something good is going on there, want a news source that tells them about what's good and what's works, what works and what's extraordinary in their community as well as telling them about problems. And uh, when we tell them about problems, we ought to tell them a little bit about how to fix those problems, not just to dump um, an enormous load of scandal and dysfunction on their plate every morning or every afternoon and walk away saying, uh, we've done our job. Uh, as I said, we launched uh, in November. Uh, our newsroom bill is 32 people, so I'm deeply jealous as well as deeply paranoid. Uh, and I spent most of my career um, working with Rosie at a very fine American newspaper, at least what used to be one of those, the Philadelphia Inquirer. And when I joined the Inquirer in 1989, I was sort of peak oil. I think I was the last one in the door before they started the buyouts and the layouts, and I think I was number 565. So I know what a fully equipped Metropolitan Newsroom looks like, and I didn't have one. Um, but our mission was to start filling in some of the public information gaps that were being left by the very sad, slow, cascading collapse of the Inquirer and the Daily News. Um, so I knew there was no way we were going to hire our way into success, so what we need to do was partner and collaborate our way into success. So um, we set out um, to create um, what I like to call a virtual collaborative newsroom, to build a virtual newsroom based on partnership, collaboration, relationship. Um, sharing of audience, sharing of skills um, with the very large number of new media niche players that were growing up in our region. A lot of them 
being led by very strong journalists who were just being sort of thrown clear from the wreckage of the Enquirer, sort of like I was, but some of them straight out of college, young people doing fascinating things. If you could page down sort of the bottom of the page, you can see a partial list. Uh, Don, we actually have to go remember to fix this. We've got about 15 partners now that aren't on this list, but um, all the way down to the bottom. Um, the li yeah, the list of, that's the list of um, partners that we're working with on content in different ways. Um, actually, if you go back up to the top, today's a pretty good day to demonstrate uh, what's going on. On any given day, I would say news or posts somewhere from 40 to 50 fresh local stories. Um, that's with a newsroom of 32 that's also producing 18 newscasts and a nightly half-hour news show. So clearly we don't do it all ourselves. If you look at the home page there, um, we have a story from State Impact Pennsylvania. Thank you, Kinsey, for that one. Um, we're, a, we're a State Impact site covering mostly the Marcella Shale get natural gas drilling. Plan Philly is a really extraordinarily solid organization based at the University of Pennsylvania that covers development, um, zoning, planning issues in Philadelphia. Um, we actually um, fund one of their reporters, um, ask them to specifically cover um, those issues in Northwest Philadelphia for us. Why Northeast West Philadelphia? Part of the genesis of NewsWorks, and this was the heart of the um, CPB grant, it seems amazing to think back that only three years ago, hyper-local was like a hot term and everybody, it's now like an eight-track cassette player, but um, everybody wanted to experiment with hyper-local. Um, I'd spent a good part of my career at the Enquirer running the neighbor's operation, which is the newspaper version of hyper-local. Um, so we sort of raised our hand and waved it at Vinny and the people at CPB and said, we'll try this. Um, so that was the first chunk of cash we got. We are in um, Northwest Philadelphia is a collection of seven neighborhoods that represents probably about 20% of the population of the city. We essentially cover Northwest Philadelphia like we were the community newspaper, just doing it digitally. Um, we've divided Northwest Philadelphia into three parts, each of which has its own vertical, its own editor, and its own team of correspondents who are all freelancers that we've trained. We hold two what we call correspondents use every year where we bring in people who think they want to do journalism, um, run them through a training, and then we just throw them out there and uh, give them an opportunity to do stories. We may or may not publish them. We pay them for everything we do, I don't believe, in free journalism. Um, and we try to build skills. Uh, it's a hit or miss proposition. Uh, Probably four out of five people who come into Correspondence you never really develop after one or two stories, but some of them have developed into reliable correspondents and a couple of them have become staffers. That's just sort of how the winning process goes. Um, we started out uh, strong in terms of traffic. Um, we have leveled off. Um, one of the problems at least my public media organization has is it doesn't have a history of investing in audience research and marketing. Um, so we really launched this with no audience research and we've done precious little marketing. So we got the audience you could get by doing really close to the ground grassroots things in those neighborhoods and what you could get by advertising what you were doing on air, but we really haven't built audience in the last year the way we'd hoped to. I know everybody's interested in business models. We have a business plan. I don't know if it's an exercise in fantasy writing that I did or in predictive. But we have run our first NewsWorks only um, members campaign. Um, the important thing is to set a very modest goal, and when you meet it, it's a success. Um, we did meet our goals. Uh, the goal was only $15,000. We made $18,000, so whoopee. Um, this year, we're going to run more of them and hope to raise about $80,000 through pure NewsWorks memberships. We think the key to the value of the NewsWorks membership really is events and offering opportunities for people to get together to talk about public issues that they care about. And since our target demographic is largely the tremendous influx of young creatives and professionals who come into Philadelphia, they already have a lot of events where they get together, drink really good beer and meet each other. And they want somebody to give them some content for that. So that's basically what a NewsWorks membership is going to be. It's going to be a guarantee that 10 times a year you're going to meet interesting people and drink great beer. Uh, we made our goals for underwriting, um, which are again modest. I think in the last fiscal year it was something like $89,000. 
it ramps up to something like 250,000 and finally 400,000 at the end of the five-year plan. Um, so that's pretty much what we're doing. I just want to say one more thing. Um, the biggest thing, challenge we had starting out was culture change in our newsroom. I had a radio newsroom and a TV newsroom. The TV newsroom was in uh, Delaware, so they never talked to each other. <laughs> Um, and there were radio guys and TV guys. What we need to do is create one unified news operation that all saw themselves as multimedia storytellers. So we did that partly by consciously hiring from different disciplines, newspaper people, um, basically digital, digital natives coming out of um, college, um, people from commercial TV, people who are videographers, mixing them in with the existing people, and doing a lot of cross-training and doing it all peer-to-peer finding somebody in your newsroom who is passionate and talented about something and having them do the training so that it doesn't always seem like what they want me to do this week. In fact, we were talking yesterday at KQED and Liz, who's a, a reporter at WHY, said whenever the PAC shows up for a news story in Philadelphia, what do they talk about while waiting for the press conference? What they are forcing the reporters to do this week. You know, whether it's you've got to be on Twitter or you've got to carry a video camera. We tried to make it what are we learning to do this week and what are we learning together. So that seems to have been something of a success. Thank you, Chris. And I'm going to use Chris's uh, setup here to ask a question that I'd like you to respond to. <clears throat> a number of stations in this room and other organizations are sensing that they are going to move into markets and become some sort of replacement, <clears throat> some sort of supplement to what the newspaper used to be. They're, they're going to supply some kind of centering thing for their communities. Is this, are, is this practical? Are we being thrown off? I, I, I'm going to refer, I talked to Tom Carlo from KPBS, the general manager. He said 20 years ago we couldn't have imagined that our news operation in radio would be the most listened to radio station in the area during drive. Now that we've accomplished that, why don't we set a goal of being a major news provider competing? I know Bill Davis is definitely on the way to seeing KPCC as a major news provider in the Los Angeles market. Minnesota Public Radio has never been shy about saying that it wants to be a, the major news provider to the Minneapolis-St. Paul market. So let's, is that a practical thing for us to do with the resource limitations that we have? Is that an achievable thing within what we have so far? I'm going to start with you. Um, the one thing I'd say is the, it's not market research, but we've done a lot of community conversations and focus groups, if you will, with people who sort of represent who we hoped would be the Newsworks core audience. Um, and they respond well to what we do, and they do want something like what we're offering. Um, the problem uh, we have in terms of them is our mobile presence is terrible. We're basically not where they are. They say, we love this, but why aren't you where we are? And where they are is living out of a device in their pocket, and we don't, our UX there is not that good. So in terms of where we need to go, um, that's probably the first place where we need to go. It's not necessarily going to function just like a newspaper, um, but there is an information need out there that I think is the logical role for public media. Done collaboratively in this notion of being the center of a virtual newsroom, not the whole thing, but the catalyst that helps make it happen. President Indiana, Indiana, a major news provider, somewhat like it, almost a newspaper level source. Would you mind if I just ask a quick follow up just to Chris? Um, I'm, you said you mentioned sort of going where people are, and I'm curious about social efforts and social platforms and how you're using those to go where people are, if you will, and if that's effective or not. Um, we uh, probably started slowly with that, but I think we've um, – that's been a focus of training and effort and encouragement. I, I, Don, you may know the numbers better than I, but, you know, most of our traffic is coming through some side door. I mean, that's the other important thing to say, that the heart of the matter is the story page, and people are coming to it from wherever they are. Um, so really, we, we treat the website now as a legacy platform. Our focus is getting the story package right, you know, the whole Create Once, Publish Anywhere. And we're doing pretty well on uh, Facebook and Twitter. We have a Tumblr blog because we felt we should at least experiment. I don't know what that's doing for us. But what's the percentage down? It's growing. About 20 percent. About, and it would be so much more if our mobile presence was easy to use, but our mobile presence is, is bad. Uh, just very quickly to add something to that from, from where we sit, um, and, I, and I think what Rosie said about uh, 
you know, you, you never know where you're going to be four years out is absolutely true. Um, ProPublica right now, if it were a newspaper, would be the number six uh, newspaper in the country in Twitter followers. We have found Twitter to be uh, an astoundingly effective means of, of getting news out and getting people to read stories. And it didn't exist two years ago. Uh, uh, and so the good news is, um, uh, it seems to me, as a, as a guy who came out of the newspaper world is now only five years into the digital world, um, my previous job before I worked at ProPublica uh, at the Oregonian was managing editor slash print. So I always felt it was a job with not a great future. Um, so uh, anyway, they keep making this thing up again. So if you miss one wave, the good news is I think there is another one coming. Um, and, um, you know, we, we certainly have not, I will add, um, have found Facebook to be nearly the tool that I certainly think it ought to be. I would hope it would be. But Twitter um, for us is magnificent. Well, one thing quick. The, the other thing we discovered is Twitter is most effective when it's about a, a reporter creating a personal brand. And then you get in all kinds of organizational issues. I can't tell you how nervous the people who run my organization get about not having intense policy control over what people are saying um, all day long. I'd like to just say a little more about the Facebook referrals. This probably isn't news to most people. I, I think what it does tell us is that the, 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 the mix of content that we, well, I was a newspaper editor for a while, too, um, decided and then foisted on our readers, that's not the content that catches on Facebook. It's the content that comes from an interesting angle that you want to say, hey, I saw this, therefore I'm going to share this. I haven't seen this elsewhere, so I'm going to share this with my friends. That goes viral. So um, it, it's an interesting, I always used to say, well, when, in the early days when newspaper people, and, and I was then, believe it or not, young, um, were arguing about, you know, should we be like a newspaper, is we never even knew, we knew what we were putting on the front page. We had no idea who was reading it or if it was being read at all. Um, so I always thought that was an interesting, and we know that, and it leads to putting Brittany on the homepage every day or the naked bike race in the case of Philly.com. But I think Facebook referrals, particularly for us, can tell us a lot about what can be successful. Um, my biggest concern um, over public media is that um, the real strength we had was that people identified um, themselves and their personality with being a public radio or a public television watcher, and that we have this remarkable asset. Of, you know, in, in the day when personal ads weren't online, people would write, you know, I'm an NPR listener, and they would mean this is something about me that you need to know which tells you something about me. That's an amazing asset, and um, I kind of watched and did some work with WGBH during the years when public television were losing their key assets. Um, with public television, one of the key assets was, I feel safe having my child watch it. And we watched as cable companies took away the children's um, kind of asset of public television and a lot of the art and theater assets and others. I think the danger for us now is that people are taking away the community asset that public radio has provided. And I think, to your point, Olivia, I think social is where we need to be. We've talked about maybe, Mark, you mentioned 25 stations in the country that really have serious news operations. I don't think news is what's going to sustain public media. I think we've used news as the identity that we feel we can keep playing in. But I think what we really have is trust and identification that I'm a, a listener or a TV watcher of public media, and I share something with you who are also interested in that. And we have an incredible community, the ability to, to convene a community. And my concern is I see that sense of community identity being stripped away piece by piece every year by other organizations that are doing it better online. You know, whether it's people who feel that, you know, they're now loyal to YouTube or people who are building their social status on you name the platform. Um, and I, I think that's the danger we've had. When I went to American Public Media to build the Public Insight Network, I founded them on the notion that, you know, we, all we had ever asked from people was their money. You know, it, the attitude was, we do great stuff, you love us, give us your money. And one of the subversive elements of that wasn't just to get the information from citizens, but to also say, we value who you are and you view yourselves as a community. And when we started the Public Insight Network, it was really a first step to doing that in a whole range of areas. 
And I think as, as a, an industry, we've gotten away from that. And we're, we're in some sense, in sense, betting our future on news. And clearly, we do incredible stuff. I was an NPR correspondent for a decade. I've worked with various stations. Um, but, I, but I think we're missing a key point, which is that we can be, even the smaller stations, because when you talk about 25 major stations making the news, you're talking about another you know, 800,000 stations that won't make it. Um, and and I, I think the idea of being conveners and really focusing on what we can do collaboratively around pulling the community together. So people, we don't have a great platform for people sharing stories they love across all of public radio. Um, you know, we can share news stories with people, often written, not always audio, but we don't have the ability to share the best audio stories among us. We can do it on other platforms, but not on our platforms. And I, I just, I, I throw into this group, my head has long been, from the founding of the Public Insight Network to what I'm doing now, has long been, how do we make the, the, the community that lives in people's heads um, and their association with public media, how do we make that real in the new world where now we have the social tools to really um, tighten that relationship deeply all of the time. And I think as we talk collaboration, I, I think we've got to put that on the table and not just how do we you know, bring together great stations with great independent news you know, investigative news organizations, but it's really about how do we make sure that this community stays one when people are picking that apart. One of the Peabody Awards this year was won by Taiwan Public Television, not exactly a large organization compared to the mainland Chinese or BBC or, 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 or other large country organizations. And one of the things they do um, is every time they do a, a project, a documentary, a series, whatever, they build in an element of what can viewers do to follow up. Where can they volunteer? How can they help clean up this area? How can they do this or that? And they say that's their hidden secret. But that's how they've been building their, their relationships, pretty much what you were talking about. Uh, Dick McPherson. Uh, just a comment. Uh, the word uh, research came up once, and a couple of folks have talked about uh, <coughs> sort of audience opinions. Uh, I was sort of making some notes here. Uh, I think we, we know a great deal about how people get the news. I mean, down to the point of which device, how long they're there, how many downloads. I mean, we have a lot of information on that. Um, the second uh, phase, though, is how do they use the news? That's cause this goes right to the social piece and a lot of what many of you are doing, uh, not only CIR and ProPublica and so forth, if it just gets out there and people, even if they read it and nothing happens, did we do our job? That's where the social thing is, is um, playing a bigger role in what we're seeing with our clients. I just wanted to mention that um, whether it's this forum or one of your, or the ONA or some association, there are some absolutely brand new tools. Uh, we just two weeks ago did a scan of uh, Maryland Public Television just because they stood up first. And we're about to do one for CIR, which Rosie doesn't even know about yet. Um, uh, the tools uh, which are uh, um, identify and essentially score people by their social media usage, which uh, platforms they prefer, whether they tweet or not. And an early test, being able to communicate as a public media organization with people knowing their social media use has produced stunning difference in their uh, willingness to forward stories, also their willingness to contribute to organizations. Uh, it, it was so um, uh, revealing in terms of looking at a, a membership base. I wasn't sure whether to recommend that CIR use it or investigate it because it's, you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe both. Um, but I just want to say there are some tools, and they're really so new that um, a lot of people in a meeting of public television stations two weeks ago. You know, pencils were flying because nobody ever heard this before. So I, I would just say that part of learning about how people use the news once they get it, uh, which uh, is socially, uh, and also the thing we, we know least about, which I think Mark points out, NPR uh, grew successfully and continues to, partly because it knew an awful lot about its audiences uh, and knows and thinks a lot about what are they thinking, what are they doing, are they in the car at home, and so forth. Uh, I, I think that is the, these platforms uh, uh, occur, uh, people use them differently. What we don't really know is how do people feel about their, uh, how it should get paid for. I mean, they know if you listen to HYY and you don't contribute, you're probably a, a bozo and you're a freeloader and, you know, it's guilt and so forth. I don't expect to get the Times every morning without paying for it. That's a subscription model. I don't think we know enough about how people feel about their financial stake in this. One of the questions we asked CIR early on was, do you want to be like, uh, the investigative kind of KQD NPR thing, or do you want to be the ACLU? 
of investigative reporting numbers. Are you a cause? Are you a service? You're both. All of you are. Um, but we're discovering that in the ways people socially react around content and money is uh, <laughs> they sort of have these two oversimplified buckets. You know, the way we look at it is uh, what's the cause that's important? Is it the arts? Is it uh, trafficking? Is it corruption? Um, is it a service, something I just use a lot? Because they seem to feel differently about their financial obligations or their financial opportunities. And I would just say two things. Uh, we'll find a way, if we can, to just push out as much as we know. And NPR may know about some of these tools, but I think there are tools that would enlighten us on that middle piece. Once they get the news, how do they use it? Um, and then I would say we are desperately in need of more research on how people feel they should pay for this. I mean, there's a part of news which people feel should be free, but there's also a feeling that, you know, I have a financial stake. I think the PBS knows what that is and is struggling against competition. NPR knows what it is and stations do, and they're uh, taking, uh, they're using, you raise fundraising, you raise money starting where people already are, and NPR uh, understands how people use a service. Uh, I think a lot of the online news, uh, particularly investigative, uh, you know, units that are here haven't quite figured out whether people should be giving to you guys instead of ACLU or in addition to, or do you compete with the Times and you, you know, that sort of thing. So I would just lobby for somebody with a checkbook uh, to focus on more research and also just as we g gather users and members and so forth, build into the process as we hope to do maybe at CR, just um, a growing understanding by well, questions, events, let's focus a little more on audience understanding because I think we know what they need because you do and that's your job, but I'm not so sure we know how they feel about it once, you know, once they got it. So that's partly something we have to do as organizations and partly something that probably should be done objectively. Maybe we should call Lee Rainey at Pew and just say Pew Internet has overlooked the, the other part of the news and, you know, because goodness knows they have the money. Anyways, can, can I throw this? I'm glad Olivia's putting her hand up because I was going to ask whether in launching, say, the uh, Human Rights Channel, which you did last spring, or one of the other news channels, whether you do that for uh, uh, after looking at what users want or <coughs> what the internal dynamic is or where you see a gap. It's, it must be a very different process. Well, yeah, I can speak to that. I was I wanted to follow up on something that Michael had mentioned, but but I think we saw that there was a lot of this content on YouTube, so a lot of um, human rights related content on YouTube, but it was very difficult to find. So we saw that there was a need, um, a gap, if you will, uh, in, in discovery of, of really valuable content. Um, and we were hearing, you know, a, from a small percentage of our user base, I would say, and most people were not coming to YouTube for, to, to seek out human rights content. But we did hear from the community that cared about that content that it was really difficult to find and that it was very hard to, under, to sift through everything that's there and understand what was valuable and, and what was not. Um, but to speak to the community piece that I think has just you know, come up in the, in the last couple of comments, I, I really agree as personally as an, an, an avid NPR KQED listener and my commute um, every morning to and from work, um, I, I really agree with Michael's point about how, for, particularly for public radio, and I'm sure this is also true for public television, that if, if that is a part of my media routine on a daily basis, that's a point of pride. And I think that's something that is very different, um, increasingly different on, on the web, right? Because people aren't as, as concerned with where they read the story. They may go to Google News, they may go to Facebook or Twitter, and which is great for, for some outlets who are, are getting national audiences that perhaps never got national audiences previously, but the, um, the source of information is, is in some ways less important, right, because information is so distributed. Uh, however, with, with, I think with, with um, a lot of public radio and public television stations, that's much more of, of, of something that you identify with. You say, I am this type of person that, that invests in, in public media or that, that consumes a lot of public media. One thing that, I f that we found on, on YouTube is that the channels that do best um, are the ones that have a direct relationship with their audience, where it's not just these are, my, these are the viewers that come to my site, but these are my subscribers. These are the people that routinely tune in and I speak directly to them. And this is something that I, I've actually pointed to um, public radio in the past when speaking to YouTube channel partners and saying, Public radio has been doing this for decades. They've been talking directly to their listeners, 
and saying we want to hear from you and that type of sort of user engagement, um, audience engagement is something that has been um, just in, ingrained in, in public media for, for much longer than the internet, before the internet existed. Now, you know, to your point, Michael, um, I, I do think that public media is a little bit behind, whereas now other types of uh, media outlets have the opportunity to have that type of dialogue. Um, but I still think you guys have a huge advantage just from a brand perspective because you have the reputation within your communities of being a place that invites participation. And so I think there's a, there's a really big opportunity to, to seize on that in social media, you know, speaking from the YouTube perspective, um, the channels that, that literally take advantage of the fact that when I watch when I watch you on the mobile screen, it's like you're talking to me. And that's really different from reading a story in print. So. Yeah, I want to follow up on your comments because I totally agree with that. The, the, the foundation of the growth in public radio that I was pointing to before, and to some extent the disintegration of the public television side, is largely a factor of use. The things that the thing that drove public radio's financial strength was that it has this large group of people who use it more than they use almost any other single medium. This this like, strong identification. Somehow I am part of who you are. You're talking directly to me. Uh, a fellow who we had to speak at our LA session, David Leroy, who's the chief researcher in public television, pointed out that the core, the most loyal public television viewers give less than 10% of their viewing time to public television. Whereas you go on the radio side, the core viewer gives half of his or her time to that station. And the problem that we have is in this proliferation of media, the content loses its attachment back. And this is, this is what Robert is struggling with. I think you have, folks have, probably have it at ProPublica, all of the investigate. Where, where does the person anchor their relationship with you to say, I am somehow part of that, and you're saying that the, the best of the channels on YouTube have this anchor. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. One thing we were finding, we, I'm part of the Kitchen Sisters, and we've been doing these big collaborations with NPR over the years, every one of them, Hidden Kitchens, Lost and Found Sound, Hidden World of Girls, and we open up a phone line on NPR and ask listeners to engage in the storytelling process with us, to create the stories with us suggest them, tell us stories, give us leads, but oftentimes those callers start producing the story well and get involved with it. And one thing I've been seeing, uh, we kind of say building community through storytelling, and you know, Lost and Found Sound was right at the turn of the century, and a lot of the people that we chronicled were old. And what we've seen now over the years is those people who are so involved with that telling process with us their whole, they start being very loyal to their local stations. They become very engaged. The stations stay engaged with them. And when those families, when those people who've been chronicled die, they have NPR in their will. And that astounds me. I never quite connected that that loyalty would go to that degree. And their children, in turn, get involved with radio and stay with us and help support our telling. So I think that intimacy, that personal connection, and also we have such an array of skills, all of us, in the media, and I think part of what is um, a huge asset is that we can share those skills and pass on that storytelling, and that's another thing, along with doing all the workshops that we do for training other radio producers, is training the community, because people have so many needs for these skills to learn how to do interviewing, learn how to do recording, audio, video, all that you know, in all kinds of professions now. And so I see that as we do these interviewing and recording workshops. And when we do them, we have New York Times reporters and we have Kaiser Health and private investigators and, you know, Bancroft Library and you name it. These diverse groups of people, they all are taking on these skills. They're applying to it to each other's work, but they feel a stake because they got those skills from public radio. So along with how do we find out how do people exchange stories and are they moving from one platform to another, that's engagement, but I think even going a step further into bringing people into that process, into sharing that Zika is a group to be watching also. I don't know if people are familiar. Uh, they are in um, Cambridge and they're developing really remarkable 
aggregating tools where audiences will be able to take content and with that content make their own stories. And it'll be a very agile tool. It'll be able to embed not just in station sites, but then be passed on through social media. And uh, I think there'll be a surprising um, body of stories that come from that, kind of new and exciting stories. Yeah, I just wanted to reiterate what, what Michael was saying, Michael Scholder, about community and that, that thing that public radio has. And this is something that I think I can bring to the table for, as someone who was a host um, 20 years ago. There was the debate then was whether or not public radio was some band of hippies that were trying to get together to, you know, broadcast the truth, or was it going to go corporate? Uh, I don't know if that debate has necessarily been solved, but there's more money, there's more audience, and the debate is somewhat the same because we're trying to figure out what to do with all these people who've discovered public radio. Well, the thing is they came to public radio because of this sense of community and because of the sense of intimacy and the style and the way that things were broadcast. And I think sometimes when we look at charts and we look at PowerPoints, we lose sight of the audience and we see the audience in abstract and we see the audience as numbers and, you know, this. I've done a lot of things in niche audiences uh, in the ethnic media, and I know uh, the power that the, uh, Olivia is talking about. When you develop and talk personally, I write columns in ethnic media, in uh, both in print uh, and on the web, and they come to you if you speak directly to them. There's an Asian American channel now called uh, You Honor My, what is it, Yo, Yo Mama or something? You offend my family. You offend, yeah, it's it's a it's the Asian American channel, and they have some of the most uh, viewed, most watched things on YouTube. And so, I think right now uh, the the challenge for public radio is to really get in touch with that community sense, that sense of loyalty uh, that that is there that people have. Uh, in the last couple of years, I've I've been a giant season ticket holder, and I'm missing a game today to be here, <laughs> but. Well, but the thing is, I go to a lot of games, and when you go to a lot of games, you know what 40,000 people look like, and you know what the same 40,000 people who are season ticket holders look like because they're sitting next to you, and you know instinctively what ARB has been talking about when they talk about average quarter hour, when they talk about team, because you can look at section 314 and you can say, boy, my average quarter hour could be a little better than that. But 40,000 people gives you a sense of what your community, what your, what your audience is. And I think that's sort of where, where, where we're struggling now, the challenge. Because we know what the good stuff is. We know what, we've done the hard part. We know what the good journalism is. And we know what the goal is and how to protect the public and how to be a watchdog for the public. This translation stuff of going into the digital world, that really should be the easy part. But we're making, I mean, and the challenge is not to have the old problems translated into this new world. So, anyway. Yeah, Judy Muller from Annenberg at USC. And, and all this discussion about the loyal audience, I think it's great. And I'm an NPR listener and I identify as an NPR listener. I worry about the demographics and age. Um, and I teach young people and they're broadcast students. They're, they've come to be journalists and I have to introduce them to NPR. And uh, once they find out that there are jobs there and that it's so much fun to tell a story with audio, they fall in love with it. But the fact that I, I'm their first contact with this is worrisome to me. And I think we really have to look at making programming that's um, I probably offend a lot of people, just not quite so stuffy all the time. I mean, just to open it up a little bit. And, and I know it. I listen to uh, KPCC. Um, primarily in, in L.A., and they've done a lot lately with programming that introduces me to, you know, like rock groups I would never have heard of and probably thought I didn't need to, and it's so much fun listening to it because it's well reported, and then I go out into the world and I'm a little more hip than I was yesterday, and I'm thinking that's the kind of thing that's needed to bring in some of these, not just that, but you know what I'm saying. It, it worries me that the audience may be so loyal that they don't want to invite in the rest of the community. And that goes for diversity, too. It's, it can't just be token diversity. It has to be in content. Uh, you know, we've got a very strong Latino media in L.A., and that's where that audience goes. And, and to get that, you've got to be telling those stories 
uh, and bringing those people in. So um, it's a big, big challenge, I think. And to see those numbers, it's very, I would bet it would be very easy to say, well, public radio is doing really well. Um, and But to worry about, you know, those people dying off, that's all. There are a couple of things I've, I've heard over the last hour or so that I just wanted to return to. I don't think we've quite talked enough about uh, communities and what's going on not only with investigative centers but other news organizations. And I think they're very relevant. Um, and I think we might want to return to that a little bit. We've talked a lot about what some of our groups call the big dogs, CR, CPI, ProPublica, 25 largest stations. But there's some credible innovative stuff going on. Uh, at the lower lower levels of circulation and so forth. So I hope we return to that. The second thing is data analysis using databases was not invented uh, in the last three years. Uh, there are a lot of uh, news people out there involved with the new uh, digital newsrooms that have these data skills, and we need to bring them back together. And we have found that data is very engaging. We were a little disappointed. Locally, we did a story on restaurant inspections. Um, we got X number of uh, people reading that story. We had five times as many people looking at the actual data inspections of the restaurants. And we got all these comments asking us to do an app so people could look up the worst restaurant before they went to it. It was sort of uh, Yelp. And uh, the last thing is the brand I don't think public media should forget is credibility. And I think sometimes we go past that, and you really want to know who you can call and who you can trust. And that brand hasn't disappeared. So when we're talking about all these things, I know we're talking about market and populations and diversity and so forth, but if, if we're a group as a whole that is the credible source of information, I think that's going to be what, what sells NPR, PBS, and these new centers. Uh, thank you. Uh, we knew this would be a good conversation, and uh, this has been the, the first half. We're scheduled to go into a break now. However, uh, Kinsey, I think, wanted a uh, point of reply to the hippies versus corporate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, that debate has, has not gone away. Um, one of the things, I mean, I think Michael kicked off a, a really interesting thread here. Um, and one of the things that occurs to me, I mean, we... We have the highest trust levels of any media organization in the country, and we have sustained those consistently as trust in media generally has declined. And I think that trust uh, in large part is driven by the sense of intimacy, the sense of voice, the, sen uh, the, the respect that we have for the listener, that, that connection to people. Um, and audio is a uniquely powerful way to do that. Um, one of the opportunities I see, I mean, it's why I'm basically saying if, if I've got to cut my budget in half, I'm going to forget the desktop web and I'm going exclusively on mobile and I'm going to concentrate on audio. Now, it's, I, my hope is I don't have to be that extreme about it, but that's the, you know, I, I say that to make the point that that's where the real strength is. And um, I, I would call out, I mean, it, it actually has gotten the newsroom incredibly excited about the possibilities because it allows them to think about getting back to some of the sound uh, that was at the core of the creativity that really launched NPR and public radio um, because shows can be incredibly confining vehicles, right? They, they acquire a particular sound and set of standards and conventions and, and length uh, that constrain uh, the way you do your reporting. Um, and there's an opportunity with an unlimited clock and a multi-channel universe to really take some risks and begin to experiment with the sound. And I think that's how we start to get back to that um, or, or make sure that in a more fragmented universe we're uh, creating those connections with our listeners. You see evidence of that in people's reaction to things like Planet Money and Radio Lab. Um, we did a, a survey of 1,500 Twitter followers of Planet Money. The attachment and loyalty is off the charts, uh, all nines and tens in terms of net promoter scores. Um, they can at length recite a mission statement that we've never actually put down on paper, uh, but that is, is dead on in terms of what we're trying to achieve. They can name every single correspondent. Um, and I guarantee you if we weren't, prohibited from doing so, if we put out a single call on a podcast uh, to donate to Planet Money, we would raise a half a million dollars overnight. Um, so trying to find, you know, teasing out those examples and making those a more consistent part of the fabric of public radio as we go forward, I think is going to be part of the challenge. And I think 
um, where things are headed in terms of mobile and audio can help us kind of focus our attention. The, the last thing I would say is, and it goes back to this whole question of are we replacing newspapers or not. Um, I didn't put it up here, but we, we routinely use a slide. Uh, if you look at any given time at the top 20 stories on NPR.org, uh, more often than not, 17, 18, and even 19 of them sometimes will be blog posts. And none of, very few of them are radio build-outs, um, radio stories that have been translated to newspaper copy. And less than half of them typically have an audio component of any kind behind them. So they're either blog posts about audio or they're blog posts that are just native to the web. And so we're really pushing hard to say, you know, success is writing for the medium. That's where the intimacy and the connection and the informality that has traditionally been associated with public radio can be captured, even in, in the printed word. And, and we need to bring those things together. But. Well, Kinsey, going into the break, I'm glad you uh, inserted a discussion of audio because uh, I don't know how many of you know uh, Tom Holman used to work at uh, Lucas, invented THX Sound, uh, then went to USC uh, in the cinema school and is now on leave. And he's the chief uh, uh, audio technology officer at Apple. And I asked him what he was going to be doing at Apple, and he said, well, uh, that thing that Bruce is playing with right now, he said, I'm going to make that sound like the world's best subwoofer. Now, of course, physically that's impossible, but I'll use uh, um, uh, psychoacoustics to make you think you're getting terrific 3D immersive audio from your handheld device. So audio is going to be even better in the future. As it says on the agenda, we'll be hearing uh, from Bruce Kuhn, who is going to take us to the next step in the issues we've been discussing uh, of uh, audio and uh, social media. And see, you used to work at Knight Ritter. And uh, Bruce's presentation will uh, give us some things to think about and to uh, discuss uh, at the beginning of this next uh, hour of our, of our conversation. But first, as uh, they used to say on KGO TV News, uh, but first, before we get to the lead story, um, Bill Davis has asked to uh, provide what uh, I think he says is the, uh, the dark cloud behind the silver lining. <laughs> Yeah, in, in, in my uh, uh, dark cloud mode, uh, a lot of the conversation and discussion around the loyalty, the trust, uh, and the brand that we have I have built up over the last 40 years is, is absolutely spot on, and nothing that I'm saying is in any way, shape, or form uh, denigrating that. What I'm concerned about is that all of that trust that we've built up has created the loyalty play which makes membership support possible. And without membership support, you don't get major giving. Without major giving, you don't get foundations. It, it, it really is the fundamental base upon which our public service is, uh, is, is able to be funded. What we have now are digital, digitally native producers of content that they aspire to reach our audience. And they have a better understanding of our audience's digital habits, and they have a, better, a greater capacity for analyzing our audience's activity on those digital platforms and picking that off. And maybe it's just once, or maybe it's just twice, but the less and less loyalty you have, the less likelihood that you are going to be able to have a functioning and stable platform going forward. And it's what I call the denominator problem. If you saw public television's decline, that decline happened as competitors, whether it was arts and entertainment, the History Channel, National Geographic, et cetera, began to erode Or uh, on the adult platform, on the um, uh, kids' platform. You had Noggin and, and, and some of the other ones. Um, that began to erode the loyalty that public television listeners had for this programming, and you saw the funding and the membership dry up or decrease as, as a result. And this is one of the, again, one of the issues that we're going to need to wrestle to the ground, the capacity to do sophisticated, 
audience analytics to make sure that we maintain the loyalty of our audience on these new platforms. The founder of either the Food Channel or the Travel Channel, I forget which one, he said, we are going to take every program that works on public television and create a 24-hour channel around it. So uh, with that, on that cheerful note, oh, Vinny, you've been uncharacteristically quiet. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I feel like I, ha I play this role at, everyone, at, at, at these meetings often, but um, th this is a public forum. We're being live streamed. I think we have a public broadcasting system here. I think public television is, you know, providing, continues to provide very valuable services to millions of Americans. And we need to be careful about analyses of a very complex set of circumstances that could lead us to incorrect uh, and inappropriate solutions. So I just want to emphasize public television enjoys just as much trust as NPR does, continues to. Public television's audiences over the last year are up significantly. Um, public television has a children's service that uh, is um, uh, for quality, uh, surpasses anything that's available, has the number one children's online service, surpassing Disney, Nickelodeon, all those other providers, that the channels which have tried to cannibalize public television's audience, like the History Channel, for example, has no history on it. E Bravo has no arts on it. Each one of these channels has found to their economic hardship and having to reinvent themselves that public television is a non-commercial service and, and, and that, that, um, that means something. And, um, and I, think, um, I think this conversation could be a little bit more enriched by um, thinking about some of the things actually that are going on in public television that are pretty positive and thinking creatively about some of the assets that public television has, which is in many areas, for instance, deep video production capacity, which we don't have on, uh, on the audio side. For all of the laudatory comments we're hearing about how terrific audio is, my guess is if we were to start polling media users, we would find that video is actually something that they have some interest in seeing. Um, so, uh, so I think uh, I think it would be helpful to have a, 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 to, to just remember that we have colleagues out there. They are doing terrific work, and um, in, as we as 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 this, this is a lot of radio people here, as uh, which is where my background is. As we talk about all the terrific success that radio has, we don't have to talk about that in negative comparison terms with television. They are providing significant services and, and um, of significant value, and we need to keep that in mind. So, thank you. I think uh, Judy Muller was about to say something like that, too. So uh, uh, thanks, Vinny. And uh, someone who is uh, successful in uh, radio and uh, television and online and um, elsewhere, Bruce Kuhn, is going to explain it all to us and tell us how. Well, uh, thank you. Actually, I'm, uh, I'm going to throw my script away because this has been such a rich conversation, I thought I'd use a little of my time to uh, up here to actually respond and point out a few things I've heard here. And so the danger on that is, it says Mark said, you have absolutely a set number of time. I had timed it, but since I'm throwing that script away, I'll have to look to you to be sure I don't go over my allotted time. Um, but the other, th and the other disclaimer I need to make, because as uh, I think Adam said earlier, a lot of us know each other in the room. Uh, you know, I want to th thank the people in the room who, you know, quite frankly, have been my intelligence base, my crowdsourcing. Uh, this is a way for me to do a disclaimer. If you see one of your ideas or phrases up there, I stole it. And so that's, the, that's my uh, common, con common creative aspect. But, you know, on this last point, just as a good example, uh, so a couple things I wanted to go back to. I, you know, the conversation on community and trust, which just got uh, repeated there, is, is so important. We're a dual licensee, so we've had conversations like this within our building. And this trust factor has been fascinating because even though uh, the convention coverage, the two conventions that were just uh, uh, in North Carolina and, and in F Florida, you know, KQED's television audience, uh, and maybe it's not surprising given the Bay Area demographics, was off the chart. So for the Democratic Convention, it was number one, PBS NewsHour was number one in the country. Even for the Republican Convention, we were number three in the market. 
And so, you know, this aspect of where our TV audience is still very, very loyal, uh, even within that. Uh, Mike's whole conversation about community, I think, is, is deep and rich uh, because it is this question. You know, all due respect to our, our former newspaper brethren, you know, part of the tradition of newspapers was, loving, was hate, loving to hate your newspaper. You know, if the paper didn't get delivered, you know, they bring me bad news, they don't respond to my letters. Whereas right now we're going through pledge, and you've got all these people that are coming on and saying, I'm giving you money, I love you, you're part of my life. So there's, as someone who came from the commercial side and then five years later moved over, it's something I'm, I'm still sort of getting used to. It, it's, you know, what do you really want, and, and, and what you, how are you trying to compromise me as a newsman? Um, the question on the news debate we had earlier reminds me, and that's an old tension we've always had as well, that it's not whether we're covering daily news or a production cycle. It's, it's the fact that both um, is what our audiences are beginning to expect. I mean, there is a reason that audio and radio and the Kitchen Sisters and those deep, rich production type shows garnered the kind of audience they did. And, and there's no question that that's a lot of it. But now, as we become more of a news conduit as well, along with our community, this expectation is that if you're not there, where are you if you're our trusted brand? And going back to that point earlier about the capacity within stations, I had a conversation with a news director um, at a mid-sized newspaper, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, public radio station, and there was a major uh, flash flood going on in the town. And, well, that's not what we do. And, you know, I don't know if we're going to beat case, uh, you know, you, the AM folks, but there has to be a presence. And so part of that dilemma for us now is how do we begin to deploy those resources. So, um, so just last week, while we are having these conversations, I did get a call from a, um, my counterpart at a major Midwestern, well, well I better change it, a southern station who said, um, I just saw Annenberg's description of where the market's going and we're going to lose our audience and we're all going to die. So we better get a strategic shift. And I've been asked to come up with a strategic plan uh, because we have to add more local programming in our midday day cycle. Uh, we have no new resources, and we have to do this on top of the 12 newscasts. We're already doing our half an hour public affairs show and the two hour ma arts magazine in the evening. And, oh, and by the way, we want our reporters to start uh, uh, doing work for the web, uh, digitalizing, uh, doing transcripts, writing original stories for their, for their, from their radio pieces, and, uh, and I need to write this by next week. And so, do you have a minute? I'm in my intelligent gathering stage. How does this work? It's not working. Am I pressing the wrong button? <coughs> Anyone? So what am I doing wrong here? Okay. This, this should do it. This should do it. Whoops, nope, that's not it. So she said, I'm in my intelligent gathering stage. And do you have a minute? And can you tell me how your web first strategy is going? And she says, by the way, I, can I, actually, I have five minutes. So, so I, I kind of felt she should be here. Uh, but it stunned me because it was that kind of rush and enormity of our web first strategy. Um, first of all, I asked her, where did you hear we had a web first strategy? He says, well, I assume, you know, you're, in the, you're, you're leading the way, aren't you? And I said, you know, I got here from KQED five years ago where I think we first needed to reinvent our radio uh, news broadcast for the reasons we were hearing he here second. Secondly, I've seen stations that who have gone web first, throwing, throwing people in without any training, without any concept, and it was a disaster, and I don't want to repeat that. But it got me thinking just about the nature of um, public radio versus where I had been. And the fact that what we do have is a interactive platform agnostic, build new audiences with content in every platform and device strategy, which you've all have as well. So one of the first things it made me realize in going through this is that, and we talked about this earlier, as we start to think about our strategies, one of the things that's different about public media, I'm doing something wrong. Uh, the green button? Oh, it's aiming. Is that the issue? There it is. That our markets are very different and unique. You know, and again, uh, that as we were discussing earlier, some, some stations have come from a great tradition of music. Some traditions have come through a great hippie roots. 
others in urban environments. And so I don't think there is a one-size-fits-all, although we have a lot to learn from one another. And all due respect, and I, I'm sure I'm not insulting any of our um, brethren here. Can I get some help here? This is not working for me. Sure. Yeah, that, uh, that the newspaper template was pretty much the same in every community, whether you were a, a, a small regional newspaper in, in mid-coast Florida or you were a metropolitan uh, daily. You know, as we talked about earlier, the product was pretty set, you know comes in paper, it was delivered to you, you got the international and national news, and the relationship between you and the audience was very, very set. So you're going to click now? Thank you. Whereas with public radio and public media, each of us has a very unique part to play in our community, and I think it's going to be important that there's an analysis goes on on what it is that you're, you're going to do in your community. So for KQED, oh, so for example, we... I asked recently our content strategies, what can we learn from our other stations? What are they doing? And it was pointed out to us, they said the challenges are so inherently different. WGBH in Boston, one of the most powerful, great national production programming, brings you all those Emmy winning shows, you know, has a budget three times ours. You know, you want to talk about disinformation, where is that model going to go? How are they going to reconfigure? That's very different from us. Our friends, as you heard from uh, uh, Chris earlier, WHYY, very different brand in the community, therefore create a new brand to get into the new space. So all of those has um, meant that I think that you have to look very deeply into uh, where you want to go. So fortunately at KQD, you know, we've had a long history, I use this context, of news and public affairs. Um, and one of the things... So we, we started early, uh, both in television and radio. You click. Sorry. Um, we had a very active, interactive. I'm sorry, you're Hold too on. far. I know. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll just I'll just go ahead. The uh, we started a an inter, a multi multimedia platform science initiative called Quest uh, five years ago. And there's one of the good examples. When the National Academy, when the funding ran out, what we were going to do with that service. And so it had to become, quote, the term we use is operationalize, uh, which means we had to absorb the cost. And um, it means I didn't get my three reporters, but those are the kind of budget fights you go through. But if you want evidence of how these things taught us very early, it was just last year when, and you want to talk about how it change, does culture change, when the Quest team, which was radio, television, and interactive, came in with their metrics report and the number of video streams for each of the segments was larger than the TV audience. And this, you, so you could actually see the conversion happening and it became very real. Press, please. So, So I bring this up to um, talk about our strategy which, and our challenge, which is the fact that, as already mentioned, we have a loyal audience already. And as you said, and they're using the new medium. They're streaming, they're browsing, they're liking us, and they're central and key to our existence. And so we have to maintain that audience while we build this new one for the future. And so the strategy is not to do one or the other. Uh, in, the, in, the phrase, in the phrase of our uh, publisher, uh, our publisher, I'm showing my old roots here, our CEO, the fact of the matter is a lot of our audience still is very dependent on our 20th century services. They do watch TV, they listen to the radio, they're on the web. And at the same time, we're going after that new audience that is, is now tuning in and trying to get us there. <coughs> So what we do is we make small bets. We make small bets and before taking those initiatives to scale. And at the same time, we're preserving, I'm sorry, we're enhancing, not preserving, our core legacy systems. And so that's why we are still emphasizing radio. That's why I didn't have my radio reporters uh, suddenly turning them into backpack journalists in day one uh, because we had, to preserve, we had to enhance that service while we're moving on to the next one. So what do some of these small bets look like? First of all, 
there's been a lot of discussion here about new audiences. So in our core strategy, millennials have been identified as the people we have to capture next. And so what does that mean? It means, first of all, we have, a month, we have an advisory group uh, of millennials and uh, a focus group. We've hired uh, Ranif, Ranif Social Media uh, to begin interpreting what we're doing. They're one of our feedbacks for us. Uh, we've hired a number of social media experts, uh, both in our marketing and communications department. And I want to talk a little bit about social media because everybody's been, uh, and I'm not the expert on that. We have a whole, whole theme on that. Most social media began in the communications and marketing departments of our news organizations uh, because that seemed like the obvious place where it should be. It's thought, it was thought about it as being a way to distribute, and as you talked about, engaging it. Yes, Mark? But the fact of the matter is, the t those are tools and the rules within each of your divisions, your membership division, your development issue, and your newsroom are different. So we suddenly had a series of questions about how do we engage our audience around news? If they're gonna be a news source, if there's gonna be discussion. So we have actually created a separate position for social media within the news organization, within the newsroom, because that function is different than the one that the community person is doing up in marketing and membership or development. I think the Washington Post was one of the first examples I knew where that, that started in communications and they realized it's really a separate function. Um, so heavy on millenniums, plus please. Uh, the lots of discussions on social media and I think I'm just repeating what everyone has said here that it's not enough just to be on Facebook. Be on, well, first of all, you have to be there. You have to be on Facebook, you have to be on Twitter. Who's on Pinterest? How many people here are on Pinterest? Uh, we don't know where any of that's leading to, but we have to be there. So one of our marketing experts, all she is doing is going to these sites, creating a KQED space, and beginning to talk to that audience. Press, please. Uh, we did as everyone did here. Well, I'm sorry. Um, we reorganized the newsroom so that our there's now we have a radio and an interactive newsroom uh, that sits together. Uh, that forms the story formation every day. We have uh, Chris, Chris spent his, his team and our teams came together yesterday to, to really get dirty on, well, how does the assignment desk really work? How does the communication thing happen? How do you assign somebody to know what they're doing if you're going to be doing a radio story or whether we're going to go on a multimedia slideshow? Lots of organizations are beginning to do this today. Um, that's an obvious step that I think you have to take. Click, please. Um, how do we manage all this? Uh, our friends at KPCC, and I may be wrong on this, so Bill's here, uh, KPBS, I think you've all taken that step of changing your internal structures where there's no longer, a, if I understand it correctly, a radio head, a, a general manager of the television, uh, but it's all just a content structure uh, and it's built into which platform it goes. We haven't gone that far. I don't know if we will. Uh, partly because, as we said earlier, our unique nature of having a television, radio, interactive, and an education system. So we do it by a matrix system right now, and we all know what that means. It means you have a lot of meetings. Um, <laughs> but it does mean we do share uh, the information across the board. There's a daily meeting. We find projects that we can do collaboratively together, and I know uh, Rosie can, it's on that model that we have done. Quick, please. We've organized our content around four topic areas. This goes to that question of what aren't we going to do any longer. We're focusing on the nine county Bay Area. We're making a big move into Santa Clara County where it turns out 23% of our services are. So I have to remind our newscast people, stop talking about San Francisco. I know it's cool, but it turns out that most of your listeners don't even live there. Um, so um, news, science and environment arts. We're moving towards a death structure. Well, maybe I've been talking a lot to Kinsey's news folks to see how death structure out of topics can help produce content and then flows on any different direction. Plus, please. Um, partnerships. Rosie will talk a little bit more about this. Uh, Chris or someone was mentioning hyperlocal sites. Uh, thanks to Jan Schaefer. We do have this relationship with the local regional um, hyper sites. The fascinating thing here, and I think it can't be undersold, Broadcast working with non-broadcast is tricky. You know, this is going to be the next level of how you do reporting together. Uh, right now, it's a simple exchange. We put them on the air. We teach them how to do a good debrief. The Oakland local people can give us insights we've not had. But we're trying to move to the next level. Can they actually gather tape for us? 
I think it's important, it's been said here, we can't relax our radio standards. That's what got us here as well. Next slide, please. Um, we've already mentioned Kinsey has talked about mobile. We have to be there. I think Kinsey, I heard at the PRPD meeting, one of your folks said that one of the reasons radio um, audience is declining because instead of waking up to your alarm clock and, and the radio going off, people wake up, grab their smartphone, start reading headlines, doing their emails. So the pattern is changing. So we're definitely on mobile. This was a ad campaign. Go ahead. Uh, we mentioned getting out to the audience, not only on social media, but again, we have to be physically out there. Uh, we copy, we partnered with CAR to do open newsrooms where we set up listening posts uh, and engagement areas where people were gathering, usually bars and cafes. Uh, it was interesting. We were in one community where we met at the laundromat uh, because we were told by the local community folks that would be where people gathered. But then when they heard the other places were at bars and things, they said, so that's what you think of our community? Yeah. But out of that came story ideas and other things that we did. So final two slides, please. So this is who we are now. Um, this is actually our building. Uh, we're a television station. We're a radio station. We're an interactive. Um, you see how it's connected on cable. We, we ingest PBS. We ingest NPR. We mix it with our material, and it goes out. Here's where we're trying to get to. Next slide, please. Uh, a multimedia content organization in which uh, that structure is blown up. We organize around content. We look at all the kind of things you've talked about, we've talked to. We continue to ingest material. And just to lead up, Bay Area content partners, they become part of the ingestion. And then it goes out on whichever device we can make work. Thank you. I will thank to Bruce because uh, he is, as uh, somebody who is here in San Francisco with ONA meeting in San Francisco, he has a few other things to do with the ONA meeting, which really began uh, yesterday in, in many respects. So thanks for taking the time to join us and uh, to make this presentation. Questions, comments, silver linings, dark clouds? Oh, okay. Robert? Okay, thank you. Uh, so I think Steve and Brent, maybe a few others, myself in here, and we're obviously not part of public media, but we want to be part of your content flow, I guess is the way I might describe it. So I'm just going to, when I started at the beginning, uh, not the beginning, but uh, when I got to CIR, it was a very simple premise that I brought to it. And as you know, CIR had been around 30 some years then. But it was, and coming from my newspaper world, which I'd seen collapse, there were several things that were clearly out of alignment. And one crucial thing was where the, what I call the content creators, the journalists, were totally out of line with the business side, with the money people. The, their values, their mission was really different. So that was a crucial thing to bring that into alignment, which is, I'll get to that, but because it has to do more with public media and the relationship we would have. But the other idea was very simple and also very complicated. How do you take the core piece of information, the story, if you think of the spokes of a wheel, and that's the center of the wheel, and every spoke is another platform, and create an organization that can tell, take that information and be loyal to the platform, but get it on that platform, whether it was radio, whether it was video, whether it was print, because the audiences were so fragmented, they want to get the information the way they're most comfortable with. That was four and a half, almost five years ago. There was no iPad. There was no iPhone. Uh, you know, so you really had to evolve into that. So that process actually has been successful. And we're a content creator partner uh, at our core. And for many of the organizations here, for NPR, for KQED, for Frontline, for the News Hour, for other shows, we're doing as much television for KQED right now as we do partner in radio. But every piece of information can be repurposed. So if you think of the story and you have a mindset that you're telling it on multiple platforms to multiple partners, you actually can create, I think, a business model. Because the same story we may do for a half hour on KQED that's broadcast throughout California, we're doing that now. There's a piece on the iFiles on, uh, called The Other Convention, which is, I think, a terrific piece of journalism about the Methodists and their debate around same-sex marriage, 
will be broadcast on KQED in the fall, and we hope it will be broadcast on PBS stations around the country. At the same time, we can repurpose that story and do it in a Spanish language version for Univision or take it to Al Jazeera and do it in a different way for a global audience. We're actually generating revenue from all of those partners and sometimes from even from PBS, but the relationship with public radio and public television is more complicated and it gets to how you sustain if you value what we do with us. The other new, and I'll bring it back to today, I mean, the last week, we, we were yesterday at uh, IGN, which is the big gaming company. Some of you were there. But if you think about evolving platforms and how to reach an audience, how many, I'm not sure how many of you are into gaming, but obviously that's a huge, huge, huge audience, one that some of our demographics would never touch. It's also, there's an older demographic, but it's younger, and it's a very, very engaged audience. And how do you take the information we do in deep textured form and bring it down to a game? We certainly don't have the skills to do that. But the goal of yesterday was to collaborate and partner with the engineers and designers who create games and expose them to what journalists do to create the game. And we're now going to be, there was a competition yesterday and a gaming, uh, an engineering company called Coco Productions volunteered $10,000, the equivalent of $10,000 in, in uh, engineer time. And we're going to be creating a game with him around a very deep, hyper-local, regional, and national, even international story around nutrition and food issues and tie it back into schools. So, you know, that's how we're thinking as an organization. And you get to engagement. Part of the success we've had it's that very early on, we created teams around the stories. And part of the team from the very inception of the story was what we call the engagement person and, the, and what I call the non-traditional distribution person. And that person really was basically going to use social media and think about it in a non-traditional way who's interested in this story. Because our early funders wanted three things, really one thing. They wanted to show we could have audience. We had no audience. You know, we're, we're a website that people probably outside journalists and they don't know what CIR is. So we had to take it, our stories, to other people who had an audience. They wanted impact. How do you measure impact? I mean, I'm sitting here hearing Linda tell the story about our uh, veterans map, which I loved. I had no friggin' idea what you did with it. And that is a huge asset for me and for CIR to take to a funder and measure impact, where it, our data set, which was national, was taken to a hyper-local level and do something we could never do. So I need to learn, you know, we're a little chaotic, but that's the kind of thing that has, is very, very valuable to explain impact. So, and then you want engagement. You create storytelling from a hyper-local level. It becomes a national story around an issue like veterans. And then the fourth piece of that is where's the revenue? So in our model, which won't apply maybe to everyone, we actually started from the very beginning charges, charging for-profit news organizations for our content. And you can imagine me, a former newspaper editor, calling some guys at the very beginning and saying, hey, we have this story. It's really good. Let's hear it. Okay. Oh, yeah, we like that story. Uh, we'll take it. Oh, by the way, uh, we're going to charge you. What? You're a nonprofit. Forget it. Well, we established that they would pay for it, and we also established something that gets to, I think, what's very important for public media, is that the same story, if it was a good story, could be used in multiple news organizations simultaneously, and the whole idea of competition, was, which was becoming so siloed, was sort of thrown out the window. The very first story we did with California Watch was used in 32 newspaper front pages in California the same day. I would never have believed that would have happened. I was stunned. And the fallout from that was that a bunch of editors from California called me and said, and they were pissed off and said, why did, weren't we part of this? And I went, my God, they wanted to be part of this. It's not, why didn't we have this story? They, so they saw something good happening. So there is a lot good, of good happening. The challenge in, that we have, and I think others in this room have, is that the funders who fund us want multiple things. Some want innovation. Some want us to cover homeland security. Some want us to cover the environment. And we have to try and meet all these different masters. But it's forced us to be incredibly nimble and figure out things as we go along. The gaming idea, from our perspective, was not some gimmick. It's how do you reach that audience? I have teenage sons. They will not watch a documentary, believe me. They don't listen to NPR or KQD. 
But if they walk in a room and sit down for 20 minutes or 10 minutes and watch a chunk of a video, they are really frequently outraged. And when, you know what they say? Why don't we know this? Why don't we know this? They're angry. They can be engaged. So you, I think we all have to think about how you reach these diverse audiences in really different ways. We're starting something with an organization called Youth Speaks, which is a national uh, spoken word poetry slam organization. If you've ever seen a poetry slam, they're astonishingly powerful, they're amazingly passionate, and the kids are remarkable. And they break every stereotype you could ever imagine having. Uh, there was one we co-sponsored here, the National Championship in Oakland about a month ago, and the one that had the most impact, the most, the theater of 2,000 mainly teenagers standing up and cheering was a young woman doing a poem about Syria. When she started, I knew exactly what she was talking about. I said, they're not going to react to this. I couldn't believe it. Within 30 seconds, the entire theater was on it. She's cheering this girl. So we're going to bring in these kids with a... Uh, uh, one of their coaches and trainers to do fact-based, deep storytelling off of our work and reach, try and reach a different audience. You talk about content for radio or audio or the iFiles, that's what, and, it's, and it's printed. And what we're also going to do is use those kids, and it's a national network, and you talk about social media, it's a national network of these organizations that we're going to try and tap into to inform our reporting and also use them as sources and as storytellers. Now, we're going to have to be very careful, obviously, because we do investigate reporting what they do, but we do that with everything. We did a coloring book, which some people thought we were, which I thought was crazy on a story we did on seismic safety, but you talk about engagement. We thought there might be 500 coloring books people wanted. We had orders for 40,000 in California. We had no money to print it. I got on the phone and called a bunch of people and got some underwriting, among them KQED. We put it in five languages. Uh, and one of the amazing outcomes was in the Chinese community in San Francisco, the feedback we got is that we thought this coloring book, which was for kids, was used by the adults who didn't speak English, who finally learned some things about what to do in an earthquake. And the capper for us is that uh, University of California the Medical School at, uh, at UCSF came to us, and they were printing 100,000 of those to be distributed in during Fleet Week here, which was about disaster preparedness in October. That is not something as a, as, that I would ever have done. And when the young woman who suggested that at a big staff meeting, or the, again, the team, she was the engagement editor, and she said, who's the target audience? And, you know, somebody said, we're going to get the guys in Sacramento, we're going to shake up this uh, agency, they're going to fix the schools. And she said, no, it's kids. It's little kids in school. And I looked at her and said, so what do you want to do? She said, a coloring book. And I said, what? And I said, okay, try it. But what, yeah, but it was really incredibly useful. And, and if you think about it, then now UCSF wants to put it in multiple languages. And one of the key things in there was for, they're thinking of it also to giving it to elderly people who don't know what to do. And one of the key tips in there, and again, you talk about the different metrics of impact, is little kids carrying a whistle on their backpack so if they're trapped in rubble, they blow the whistle. That would apply also to people who are really old. It would apply to any of us. But it's not, you know, it's little tidbits that if you take the chance and let follow the path, you're going to lead to things. So the other uh, thing, I guess, the messaging here is if we are valuable at ProPublica and INN is valuable to public media, there's got to be a way, and I think it is valuable because I know when I talk to John Boland here and Bruce and others, Investigative reporting is something that people really react to. It, it does tie you to your community because you're creating a difference in their lives. And at a time when a lot of people feel helpless and overwhelmed by problems, you actually can create solutions. So, you know, we've been in talks. We're now in joint fundraising with some people with KQED. But there's another issue here that I think is really important, which gets to the power of your membership. There's an opportunity to do fundraising, which actually can help sustain what we do and help you in the future, which is raise funds clearly for the work you do with outside organizations that impact your community. That could be highly valuable to you and highly valuable to us. The fact of the matter is if we do a deep investigative story, if ProPublica does it and brings it to somebody, they're saving you, we are saving you 
tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars in incredible research and information that you then can take to all your platforms. There is value in that. You couldn't even put a dollar value on it. You know, I, somebody will say to me, how much did you spend on that? And I'll sit there and go, uh, $300,000. How much revenue did you get? Twenty. You know, what's the impact? But there is value to you guys and there's value to us. And the other thing I think we and ProPublica and, again, others are doing at a local level, we have to be incredibly, incredibly innovative. And we think of ourselves as a multi-platform partner. We can deliver a print version. We can deliver, help you do, you know, bring in your expertise to do radio. We can deliver video. We can give you data, which becomes highly relevant to your community. And you can turn it into very local stories and engage your community. So we're really at the nexus, I think, of not solving these problems, but in a moment of total change and transformation around the technology and information. And it's organizations like ours and others that I think can help together, you know, in these partnerships really solve some of these problems. And what I see is a tr pushback and concern about uh, your funding sources. Internally, there are huge dynamics around collaboration and partnership. I know it's really hard. But what we've been able to do, and again others, is create an internal culture where that's central to the model. In a big newspaper, I was the editor of a big newspaper, if I wanted different departments to collaborate, or even within a department to collaborate, the shit fights were ridiculous and, and really helped kill the newspaper industry in a way, or part of what led to the demise. So these new cultures of collaboration and creating teams are really doable, but it, it's really got to come down from the top, and the, the key leaders of the organizations have to believe that there's value in it. If I call somebody or talk to somebody, so uh, 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 you know, they're not going to like it. I just say, forget it. You know, this, this, it's, we don't have enough time. But these cultural changes really can come from success and looking at what's happening. And the thing about journalists, they love working on good stories. That's the motivation. So you can frequently get that to happen at that level, but you've also got to get the team built in and the belief that the collaboration and the partnership is most valuable. Um, you know, I, I think I'm just going to shut up. Thank you. Good job, Robert. Uh, and uh, I want to l let's play right off of, of Robert's presentation, keeping to keep in mind what uh, we heard from Bruce. Uh, What's going on, Robert, when you go into the room and you start talking with a GM or a program director? Are, are you finding a lot of receptivity? You do the same thing. You, are you finding that the organizations, public and corporate, uh, you know, are they saying, we, we want to make sure that you're there, we're willing to do these things? Or are, and, and, and are the deals that you're able to strike of the type you just mentioned, which is $300,000 out, 20000 in? Let me start with you. Well, quickly, uh there is receptivity. I think, you know, and again, like I said, we're in talks. Part of it from our perspective is we just can't add on more work. But if you have the skill set, whether it's a producer, whether it's an animator, uh, you know, that's where the teamwork has to come in. And I think the benefit is exponentially. You're, you're, you're getting more information. You can tell it on a broader platform. The other thing for us that's happened is it's been amazing, really, is that we have, you know, basically have a syndication model where people came to us and wanted our content on different platforms. So I think it, can, it does work. And with the collaborative model, and Steve, they've done amazing work on this, but for us it's a little different because, for example, in California, we can get multiple news organizations, and this could also apply to local, public media, working together on the, the big macro story, but also taking the local data and really making it relevant to your community. What Michael said is really cute. Creating that community is valuable, and these things are happening. So I think there is reception to it, and you can see the success. And I think part of it is, you know, really sometimes just banging heads. But, again, it goes back to the value of the story. And if you have the right story, you know, we're finding it works. What's your... Thank you. 
A Google alert telling you they're using the stuff? Showing, showing that it appeared somewhere. I wanted to get some reaction from some of the institutional stakeholders here to what Robert was saying. You know, Kinsey, you're a partner to some of these things. Where do you see, again, over the, let's, let's use a longer time frame, over the next three to five years, outside collaborations with NPR, do you, increasing, decreasing, how do you fund them? You probably need to turn it on, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it working now? Mm -hmm. It's just slow? Okay. okay. Um, no, I would expect the collaborations to continue to increase. I mean, as, as culturally, I mean, public radio has historically uh, been pretty insulated and not had to collaborate extensively in the past, and so there's a whole sort of uh, cultural ethos to overcome, and that's in process. It's also a process of learning what works. I mean, it, it, what we found, particularly with the with investigative reporting, um, like this is high stakes reporting, right? And so we're putting our reputation on the line. We've got the deep pockets in the picture if something uh, goes amiss with a story. And so there's a sense of ownership that comes with it and developing the confidence, uh, not just in the organizations, but in the individual reporters that reporters are working with is a key part of that. And that's, that takes a little bit of time. I mean, I think um, the experience generally has been that with time, the relationship deepened. We figured out which stories were appropriate, uh, which individuals played well together, how we could use each other's resources to good effect, and I, I would expect that to continue. Judy, I'll, I'll pass this to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, just, I, just have a, I have a question, and I was asking Stephen about this earlier, and I'm glad you brought up the, the issue of collaboration with audio and video. When you're doing investigative pieces from the get-go, say you're sharing with 60 Minutes, which you've done, um, but there's a very different element that comes in when you bring in a camera or a tape recorder and you're doing all that initial work and you want to be in on those initial interviews. Does that, how do you work that out? Well, there are, there are clearly com complexities. I think that, as we were saying, um, in an investigative story where you don't know where you're going, 
There certainly are problems with, you know, sort of figuring out the story arc and the characters, and the meter is running if you're doing television at a very high rate. And we're sitting there, as we did sometimes, saying, well, we're just not sure what we have yet. On Law and Disorder, which was one of our very best collaborations with Frontline on the New Orleans police shootings, it actually became so tense that at one point I did say to Frontline, well, could we get a little more time? Could you beam this thing out live? And they said, geez, we don't do that. We send it to the stations, you know, whatever, how many days in advance. Actually, it got to the point where they booked the satellite time, and we were within about six hours of having to make that call to do that. Fortunately, it didn't happen. So, yeah, obviously there's an uneasy, I think, coexistence between the magic of investigative discovery and the reality of doing a certain kind of medium. For us, it's a little different because we actually shoot the video. We have a video team. We have produced it. So that also means we can repurpose it, and we have the rights from a business model. But it is really a delicate dance, and, you know, you get a print person who doesn't want to have the camera in there or the tape recorder. You know, it's – but I think if you – if the goal and the mindset of the organization or who you're working with is how do you get the story done the right way, you can work these things out. It doesn't mean it's not complicated. The other thing that I think our print reporters have seen is that sometimes TV or radio, because they need the sound, they need the moment, will get something that makes the print story much better. And then that really has benefited sort of – when the story gets better, everybody feels good or more nailed down. And I think that's probably happened with you guys. Yeah. Just quickly to follow up on that, we did a piece where we had initially the tip on a guy who was a Guatemalan. He thought he was the son of an Army officer. It turned out that his – a father had actually slaughtered his family in this horrible massacre. He discovers this. We work with This American Life on that, and the requirements that they had in storytelling and gathering of information and reporting, I believe, drove us to a much, much higher level of story. And ultimately, I think the text story, and I think Sebastian Rotella, if you he here, would tell you that. He was the reporter on it for us. Uh, that the combined effort was an amazing thing where both sides kind of drove the other to levels of rigor and, and also storytelling that we wouldn't, neither one of us have had. I just wanted to add one thing. Um, <clears throat> given that I teach my students all have one of these things, and it's uh, text, video, and audio, I think this will be an interesting historical discussion that we can archive. But in about two years, well, it won't really matter at all. Uh, I think it's interesting to hear how print and broadcast come together, but I ran IRE for a while, and we had about broadcast investigations that seem to get done and do well. I think it's just a matter. We're just kind of you know, juggling our way through the opening stages of realizing it's all one media. So. This conversation started with, with, a, with an example of how do you bring in new audiences. And I think what we've been trying to do with, with our filmmakers who may not have the skills, obviously, to be working in, some do and some don't, some help we, we support, but um, is to team them with the, those who have the skills and work with developers and gaming developers and, and with the goal of bringing in those new audiences to public media. Um, it is true a film like Garbage Dreams about the Zabalin in, in Egypt will, won't attract, you know, maybe a 15-year-old or a 10-year-old, but creating a game about you know, recycling that they're addicted to sort of how, how do I how do I get a goat to sort of chew food on, on my screen? It was addictive, you know, and they had to do it according to a time clock. And and then that led them into actually watching a film and learning something. So I think it's really critical sort of thinking about why you're why you are teaming people together. I mean, we've been in conversations with air about this recently after as, as a continuation of their local or program. And I think it's, it's really important that we we team creative people together. Um, and with the experts in the field to be able to do this. Um, and I think, you know, having the funding sources and to be able to do that and look at how the changing media environments um, are doing that is, is really critical. The other thing is, and just going back to, and I'm so happy Michael raised this earlier around the community issue, um, is that it's, we, we've been spending a lot of time talking about the producing community in service of sort of a larger community. Um, one of the reasons we took on the Women and Girls Lead Program as sort of a three- to four-year commitment is that we – Typically, on the, our, our typical experience on the television side is that we function from this sort of stunted model, like you sort of come in and you go out. You know, we have an event for a week and then you sort of go out with, 
and then come back to those community partners. But the Women and Girls Lead Program is a sustained partnership. You know, if I can, if I can work with, you know, 10 major organizations like the Girl Scouts of America for, 10, for three to five years, they see a commitment and they see the build of a conversation um, around some content. And I think it's really critical to think of building community in the partnership way around the build of that content and seeing the partnership beyond a promotional partnership. Um, and a deep meaning partnership that then how they see their content sort of feeding in to the work that we're trying to do is really essential. I can relate to that, Jim, and I think it's important for us to, we talk about collaborating with each other or across from newspapers and public media, but it's really important to forge collaborations with non-media organizations. And I think one of the really valuable partnerships we have was started by Michael, and it involves gaming, it involves data, and that's the Budget Hero Federal Budget Game, which I would have been at the Tech Raking Conference yesterday, but I was in Washington, D.C., launching the election edition, the 2012 election edition, because this is a game that's been out there for four years now. And we had no idea what we were undertaking in terms of launching that and how many times we would have to update the baseline numbers of that game with what happened with the economy. And so it was a major commitment, a long-term commitment. But the results of that are that game has been played more than 1.3 million times. We have an amazing amount of data, demographic data. It has brought young people into the Public Insight Network. Some 50,000 sources have joined the pin through the game Budget Hero. And now, thanks to, and our partners in that are the Wilson um, Center in Washington, D.C. And they went out and got a grant from MacArthur recently that allowed us to update the game for the election, but also in this spirit of maybe the best way to do it is to just demonstrate it yourself. I mean, you can try to cajole your partners into doing things, but we just said, we know we can get journalism out of this game. We've got this data. We have these sources who are talking to us who are craving a detailed, nuanced conversation about the deficit and the debt. We are not hearing that conversation occur in the media or in any sphere. So we hired a reporter. He is a Budget Hero reporter. He's a former online managing editor for NewsHour, and his job is to get journalism out of gamification. And we hired a statistician who will actually analyze that data, and then I hope we'll put the data sets out for the public to take advantage of and see what they can do with it. I think you can create, you have these creative partnerships where you could do, they're strategic partnerships. You do joint fundraising. But don't underestimate the commitment that you make and that, you know, innovation is iterative. I mean, we always look for these eureka moments, like we're going to develop the app that is the ultimate thing. And people say, oh, I'm sick of Budget Hero. When are we going to do a new game? And I'm like, you know, this game could not be more relevant right now. And I think that's, a, you know, not to take this a far afield, I think we are talking about innovative, creative ways to do journalism, to get data, and, you know, I think that one of the things that we can do is build off of our own successes and the success of others. And I'd like to invite anyone to embed that game on their website, um, because people spend an average of eight minutes with that game, and, um, and it's pretty powerful. So I, I appreciate the, the work that you all are doing and hope we can talk about ways to work together. Um, I was going to say, I think the biggest change I've seen in these future media conferences or public media conferences is the level of collaboration that is going on now is dramatic from three years ago. I think public media, someone said it, you know, there's been a hesitance to collaborate. And I think for the most part, we've gotten over that. Um, I think what APM is doing with Budget Hero and, and updating Budget Hero and doing that with other groups has been wonderful. Rosie, you've done incredible collaborations. PRI has, is collaborating with ITVS and Women and Girls Lead. Um, but you may have heard the news that we were acquired by WGBH in order to be able to collaborate more deeply across a lot of their, their shows and a lot of their um, different skills, video and the like. Um, we, um, we're doing a couple of things that I think I, I, my call would be collaboration is absolutely key. And the Public Insight Network was founded on the idea that we needed to borrow people's trust to reach communities that weren't communities of public radio listeners. And the team actually got very, very good at going to outside organizations to borrow their trust with socioeconomic groups that we weren't reaching, with ethnic groups that we weren't reaching, 
with regional groups, with meetings all over Minnesota when we were building out for Minnesota Public Radio. Um, but I would say what, what has changed and what, where we still aren't is with the social element on it. And so what we've been trying to do at PRI is with each of the collaborations we've done, and we were one of the collaborators on a project called the State Integrity Investigation, which was ranking and grading every state on its risk of government corruption. Um, huge, huge results, similar to what you're seeing, um, Stephen, with the projects you're working on, you know, 13,000 articles. And, um, and, you know, explicitly we worked with a lot of stations. We collaborated with stations and provided editorial support to them, flew them in for training on it. But what we also did is we put together a site that made some people uncomfortable, um, which is a site that basically um, in encouraged people to engage in the topic, to send their report cards to their legislators, and to get involved in very various ways. And, you know, I don't think we were, um, we went as far as we could have gone because of a, a standard um, journalistic instinct that we're there to lay things on the table for people, and if they want to take actions, they go. But we are in a new world where I think as journalists, we are doing a disservice to people when we lay out a story, especially a story that moves them in a variety of ways, and then we don't give any hint as to what to do with the emotion and the passion that we've created. And, um, and I think, you know, what we tried to do with State Integrity was to begin to move to a place, and one of our partners is a policy group, Global Integrity, and as part of the explicit grants that we got, their job was to actually work with legislators and outside groups again, away from the journalism organizations and the partnership. Um, we're now approaching a new project that we've begun to get funding for around immigrant lives. And what we're doing with that is we're creating a social media team not to get followers and likes, but to literally make sure that the material we have is going out where the conversations are already happening on the web and adding value to them. And we're going to be very focused in just a couple of areas. But I, I, and, and part of that is we're collaborating with New American Media and others. Um, we're now doing collaborations with various ethnic press. But I think the idea is that as we collaborate, each of the collaborations need to be more than just the content collaborations. They actually need to be the collaborations with the groups that are interested in it that we've been uncomfortable actually getting involved with because those are kind of parties or communities of people with interests and inevitably there are advocates in them. But again, our, our job is to bring the truth to the table. We're advocating for the truth. Those groups can advocate for what they want, but I, I'm saying I think we need to move collaboration into the social sphere, which will also then, I think, enable the, these communities of people to become part of our communities through this strategy. Um, so I, I'm just pushing that there are, there are many ways to go around social that I think can actually expand what we're doing. And gaming, we were your co-sponsor of the gaming event yesterday. You know, gaming is a way to, again, reach this youth audience that several have mentioned, you know, we're, we're not doing well. But it takes us very much out of our comfort zone, and it, it often means that we've got to go the extra mile, too, to find people that will do more than just play the game, but actually will use the game for whatever their own purposes are in order to reach their communities. So I wanted to uh, build on the, the topic of collaborations in the social sphere. I, th I would also encourage you guys, as you think about partnerships and collaborations, to think about non-traditional media as well as, you know, uh, nonprofit organizations. On YouTube, um, we have found over the last couple of years that as we, as YouTube is shifting towards the channel model, and I was saying this to some folks during the break, shifting from sort of being an individual video-centric user interaction model, which is really how the majority of people use the site today, and really trying to shift behavior to be very focused around channel consumption, right? So building audiences, like that is the, the holy grail on YouTube today, is how do you actually build an audience around your content? Um, and now we have a whole team at YouTube that's dedicated to audience development tactics and best practices. Um, and it's a, it's a completely new territory. But one of the most effective, um, probably the most effective uh, strategy that we've seen emerge, and, we, and I say emerge because it's not something that YouTube went out there and dictated. It's something that we saw happening within the community that we're now realizing is, is a really powerful way to build audience, is what we call, col we call collapse. I mean, it's our cute little funny name for it, but it's, it's collaborations, all the stuff that you guys are talking about, where you have two channels or, may, or potentially more um, come together and work on a project. And it might be a video, it might be a series of videos, and they appear in each other's videos, and then they separately promote um, that content to their respective audiences. And so what you get is a cross-pollination of two different audiences who are then watching the same content together, and then in all likelihood, they go and they, they subscribe to the other channel that they weren't already subscribing to. And this is 
hands down the most effective way that we've seen new channels build audiences working with older, more established channels. Um, and I think it's, it's all mostly out of goodwill at this point. You know, there aren't necessarily financial relationships involved, but they're realizing that you can't get anywhere on YouTube until you have an audience in place. Um, and one other just example in the news space is that Reuters uh, has, you know, embraced this idea and they actually did a, a debate with two really popular news and political commentators on YouTube. One guy, um, Jenk Younger from the Young Turks, who some of you guys may have heard of, and Lee Doran, who has a very popular conservative-leaning channel called How the World Works. And they got them together and they both promoted to their respective audiences on YouTube and it helped Reuters actually do a really interesting and innovative new um, programming on YouTube. I wanted to add one thing about the diversity of the of uh, and what Budget Hero has given us. It's given us conservatives. And I think we haven't talked about, you know, I think Judy started to talk a little bit about our echo chamber in public media, or whether it's we don't have, you know, we don't reach youth, but um, I will say that, you know, that is an important, I mean, if we want to serve the community and communities that we're currently not serving, that, inc that's, that includes forming partnerships with people that we don't have much trust with. And, um, you know, we did this through a, um, a storytelling project called um, Conservative Moments, where we just started hearing from people in the, well, we, power, we partnered with the Powerline blog, which is a conservative blog um, started by a lawyer. It's got a good listenership and, or good readership. And we put a query out there that we wanted to find out from conservatives particularly, you know, when they kind of knew they were conservative, like what was, where, what's the personal story behind their ideology and, and their politics? And we put that out there, and I'll tell you, the, the first thing we had to endure was a lot of, of backlash, like why would we talk to public media? Why would we trust them? But building trust, as Michael said, with people who have trust with their own communities is a key. And so pretty soon, though, when people started to submit those stories and we actually produced something with them that defied what their low expectations of us were, quite frankly, which is they thought they would contribute their stories and we would use them as a foil. You know, that we would, you know, and we didn't. And we, and it was, I think that that is something that we have to work harder at, which is not just partnering people who think like us and, and um, are like-minded and organization, but we have to reach outside of our, of our echo chamber and our comfort bubble, if you will. I just had a question for Chris and Bruce. I know in the collaborations that you've done with, I hate to say it, hyper-local, uh, newsmakers, what have been the most successful partnerships that you've found? Have you had that linking back and forth to and gaining audiences on both sides? And um, also if it's across platforms or if it's more specifically uh, online? Um, one of the main things the partners want from us is access to the radio platform and learning how to do radio. So we've done a lot of that. Uh, probably. The single most successful collaboration was with kind of a new media niche organization called the Public School Notebook in Philadelphia, which sort of covered the school district and school reform from a parent's perspective. Um, we were able to sort of team up and hire a reporter who's done some pretty significant um, enterprise investigative work around the school district. He's been covering and basically exposing um, uh, standardized test cheating directed at the principal level at schools uh, for the last year. So th that's sort of at the high level. At the lower level, we've worked uh, in the neighborhood um, with an internet radio station called G-Town Radio that really wanted to do what they always call NPR style stories. So we've been working with them for more than a year on a certain project to do some community-based uh, radio, which has begun to air, and we've worked a lot also with uh, something called Youth Radio in Philadelphia, and we had a tremendous um, series of stories from uh, young radio producers who we never would have had on our air before talking basically about their family lives and what their parents mean to them, they're beautiful pieces. So there's been a variety of things that have gone on like that. We. Um you know, ours was part of the, uh, they mentioned Jan Schaefer earlier, this was part of the JLab grant to actually look at the issues of collaboration and, and a lot of the issues we're talking about here. 
And uh, we were part of the 2010 class, and we were the first broadcast partner to come into that program. It had mostly been newspapers up to that point. And so a lot, a lot of the issues you brought up here is what we had to noodle through, uh, because a lot of the new hyperlocal sites, what are we going to do about those that had an advocacy bent? Uh, it was interesting as we looked at what some institutions were allowed to do and what we weren't allowed to do. In the end, uh, there was a, a, a bicycle coalition uh, hyperlocal site, you know, clearly of interest to the bicycling community in an urban environment as we tried to change pr public transit. And the fact of the matter is uh, they were doing journalism. They were reporting on bills and, and what was happening on policy levels at a degree that that was terrific. Uh, but because of the way they constructed the site, they were also mixing it up with all their political endorsements and they, uh, they were bad mouthing uh, folks. And it, and it became tricky because we, as we were going through that exercise. So I said, what happens when we discover that that's a KQED partner? And we go to, and we go there and there's the blog that says Senator, uh, you know, Jules is, you know, an ignorant asshole because he doesn't understand. So it, in the end, when we thought we would be much more encompassing, we did have to we had to we come up with some strict guidelines that they had to have a separation of church and state. We had to have sort of you know, what their journalism mission was. And in the end, it, it meant we couldn't partner with a lot of people I had wanted to partner with because for the reasons you were talking about. Uh, but in the end, we got um, eight great starts. And um, and to what Chris had mentioned at that time, we asked, what do you want out of it? What do we want out of it? You know, the linkage only gives you so much back. And it is what I call, and as you said, it became the radio effect, the, the power of the megaphone. So inevitably, even though we didn't have metrics on it, uh, we would debrief the reporter about that city council meeting that occurred last night in the protest. And inevitably, that person would say, uh, uh, gee, um, we had that story up. We had to build a big out package. It was only until I was on KQED that I started getting phone calls or I said, I heard you. So the whole strength of that um, megaphone is huge. But I do want to get back to the idea of quality again. I mean, going back to our production values, you know, this notion of just putting a mic in front of a, a person doesn't cut it. And so we have done the same kind of training and how to do a good debrief. We have made it optional if for a partner that wants to begin to collect tape and actually try and produce that we will both pay them for the tape and we'll provide training. So we're trying to incrementally uh, move it out. What has it done for us? They're part of our new. We, and the other point point is you have to have you have to have a partner's editor. It, it can't fall on the on the you know, back thing of we were going to have the managing assignment editor in the morning, you know, handle all the partners as well. Well, I think that individual has enough going on. So that editor handles all the uh, interaction, comes to the news meeting in the morning and starts pitching, says Berkeley side today has a great story on this. I want to pitch it. I want to do a debrief or we want to do a, an expanded version on it. So I think the dirty details of how to make it at a high level are, are, are just starting to get figured out. But we think, think it's been very successful. It's got us into stories. And, and again, they're in the communities. They have an entrance in a way that we as a regional news site couldn't do. Just in the vein of good grant relations, I wanted to mention that we have a staff person whose only job is to manage these partnerships and do the training and Feathers Foundation pays for it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, also, one, one other thing I want to mention quick. Uh, up in the hyper-local area, there was a city council election, and somebody I knew from previous work at the Oracle called me up and said, Chris, nobody's paying any attention to our election. We want to do a debate. We don't know how to do it. And I said, well, I do know how to do this. So we held a series of community forums for people to identify the issues that mattered most to them in this race, frame questions for a debate. We invited the candidates to come. They all came. Their only job was to listen to what the people said. In the end, we gave them two minutes to say, what did you hear tonight? And then we held the debate. I was worried nobody was going to show up. I was at a church in Germantown. They were hanging from the choir loft. We had about 400 people there. And that was really the moment we became the local news source for that neighborhood, when they finally realized, hey, you guys are here. You're doing something. So. I wanted to uh, pick up on that point you made about quality and also make a comment about news and public media and collaboration. Um, this was started with the little quick debate earlier about breaking stories and about 
whether doing analysis and where public media stands in that. Five years ago, I worked at PBS NewsHour on the news desk, and we were scrambling late into the night trying to get primary results out of Pennsylvania, competing with networks. And it was impossible, and it was exhausting, and it just wasn't going to work. But then we'd go on the next night, and Gwen Eiffel would talk to David Brooks, and it would be incredible, and it would be substantive, and it would be owning the things that we're equipped to do. And so that was, that's really my main point, is it, owning the things that you're equipped to do really, really well, because then that eight-minute substantive discussion is a fantastic eight-minute podcast segment. It's a fantastic eight-minute YouTube segment on your YouTube channel. It's a fantastic Facebook post, a fantastic Flipboard update or, or whatever, uh, wherever it is that you put it. And I think the same applies to staff bandwidth. You know, when that was, um, when you talk about training your reporters at KQED, um, or wherever you are, and, and giving people the backpack to shoot and edit and cut and tweet and do all those things, and, and they can do all those things, but there's so much to be said for the shooter that just shoots really, really well, the storyteller, and whether it is uh, the case of getting those people in the same room and teaming up with a developer that just does that, with someone in data analytics and Google analytics that just does that really, really well, um, there's just, I think, so much to be said for that kind of really specific collaboration. Quick question about uh, a collaboration with non-traditional partners, uh, building on the coloring book and the, um, uh, and actually, many what you mentioned before about PBS Kids, trying to reach younger audiences. Um, are, are there other examples besides coloring book? I'm, uh, that would be uh, interesting. <coughs> Favorites. Um, again, because we're co constantly talking about who's the audience, and, and it's a very diverse audience. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if I mentioned, like, we just signed, we're in a relationship now with Univision, and from early on, for example, we, we, we push stuff to Spanish language and, and other ethnic media, especially in California, and, and give them translations. But one of the things that happened, and this came from uh, really, uh, one day I came into work and there was a former Pulitzer Prize winner sitting on the floor under a table with finger puppets talking in a really funny voice, and somebody had a camera, and, and they had a little set they made, and I went in, and, they, and I said, what are you guys doing? And they looked at me and said, oh, we'll tell you later, we'll show you something, and they were like really embarrassed. And uh, so like a few days later, they said, we'll show you what we were doing. And this idea, and other people have heard this, came from the office manager, and it was a finger puppet video for three to five-year-olds, six-year-olds, and they came off of two stories we'd done. One was uh, just a general explainer about what pollution is, and the other one was about uh, lead-tainted jewelry, and, and the story was really about China, a company in China sending highly tainted jewelry to the U.S., and we did lead testing, and, you know, some kids were actually getting really sick and even dying in one case where a kid swallowed it. And what do kids do? They suck on the thing on their neck. So this former poster winner in this voice was Mr. Owl telling little kids not to suck on jewelry. And, but that came up from the staff. And actually sitting here, I want to, because we don't know what to do with it. You know, one of the weaknesses we have, we're not, we're not aware of all the, quote, products we have. But I think, you know, we, we put it on our website, but you barely can find it. But it gets to something we've talked about, and I think that is really relevant to everybody, which is creating another connection in your community, which we, we you know, and it's very non-traditional thinking, for, especially for someone like me. And Chris at the Inquirer was at a tour, he walked out, but he did something in the communities to push back when he was at the Inquirer to actually go in the community and find out information from them was huge from certain people. But it's the solution piece. What is the solution? How do you get a solution? How do you lead people to connect through social media who might be able to help you answer a problem in your community and create communities around solution? And one of the things we've done, which hasn't been used by a lot of our partners, and again, this came from a young staff member, she created something called React and Act. So you're reacting, you're upset, here's how you can take action. It's not telling you what to do, but if you care about this issue, here are the key stakeholders, here's how you can, other community people who can might be involved. And again, as somebody said, this takes management. You can't just do these things. So I think these are all nascent ideas. Some places do it better than others. But I do think as, as we 
description or definition of what we do as journalists evolves. Uh, and I certainly did this long. You'd write your story in the old days and you hope something happened. But now, because of the tools and the technology that are constantly changing in social media, you, I think there's an obligation to bring people together and, and lead somehow without being seen as advocates, because I think that undermines your credibility, this, the drive towards solving a problem. And the problem can be in your neighborhood, it can be national, it can be even international. And there are solutions and the, the wonder today is you can connect all these things. People can be connected around issues and things they concern are cared, concerned about. I can't tell you exactly how to do it, but I can see that it's a crucial concept. And the other thing that's very obvious, and I'm going to say this, is that one of the things I heard, I think Chris said, they're not good in mobile. Somebody else said it's a weakness. NPR, it sounds like you're showing the trend up on mobile and listening. I think one of your stats, and you, you talked about this. So clearly... Mobile is, is a huge investment from everybody. And when you're creating your content, making sure that it's going to fit these evolving and new mobile platforms. We're not very good at it either. But again, our model is to give content to others to use. So clearly there are things happening that we're all going to have to be in position to take advantage of uh, as this technology keeps changing. And that's where I think within the organizations, the marriage of the content brain with the engineering brain is really going to be one of the things I think that's going to solve some of these problems. And that's not, that's harder to get to because, you know, one of the things we did at IGN to get to this event yesterday, we went there and we did something we call behind the story. A lot of organizations can do it. But we showed them how we got to a big investigative story. We showed them all the work, all the data, the different elements, whether the, the videographer, the animator, and the whole team presented what they did. They were completely blown away. We did it at Google. The same reaction. They, the engineers could not believe what journalists do, and they didn't believe how much data we had and how we didn't know what to do with all the data. So that alignment going forward is really going to be important, and for the funders to bring able to fund that kind of thing and understand the value of it and messaging around that is really something we all need to do. Just to go back, really quick example of, uh, of public media sort of re reaching new audiences. There's this great set of videos, I don't know if you guys have seen them on P that PBS has done, where they've taken PBS classics and remixed them. Have you guys seen these videos? You know, the, the Mr. Rogers remix has 6.9 million views, a third of which have come from mobile. Um, there's a couple others that have million, millions of views. Anyway, it's a great, like when we saw these at YouTube, these were, everyone was passing around the office. It was like a, a just terrific example of an organization that I think most people think of as not necessarily reaching sort of that demographic, uh, embracing the medium and really just kind of going for it. And they're amazingly entertaining. I encourage you to check them out. I wanted, if, if I may, um, because we're also talking about legacy, and I did reference uh, my colleagues at KPB, KPCC and, and KPBS on the organizational structures that you've done. And I was wondering if, if, if any of your lessons or what you've done there would be of interest to this question of how these models are going to look, because as I understand, you've changed titles, the, the interactive and radio no longer exist. Um, and TV, KPBS is a dual licensee as well. KPCC has uh, radio and interactive. Um, we hired a director of news and editorial strategy in 2010. So she's been there about a, two and a half years. And we took the anybody who creates news content on any platform works under her. So we have about 35 to 40 people who are in that department. And I have been at the station 22 years and been involved in interactive for 20, 15 to 20. And prior to that, um, we had made a lot of strides. We had a newsroom for over 20 years. We um, had the reporters, the what I call the coalition of the willing, the reporters that were more interested, putting their stories um, online. We had some cross training already happening between radio and TV, but this final step of putting everybody under one management has made a huge, huge difference. You, you, there's just no comparison in the um, amount of coordination, managing the logistics, the amount of content we can create. 
Um, so I highly recommend it if you're thinking about it. And um, did you have something? Okay. okay. We, we, we have 15 minutes to go. Gentlemen, yeah. so quickly, um, Kenji's going to give a quick remark. Nobody has a comment you want to be waiting on. Thanks. All right. Uh, we didn't have the complexities that a uh, joint licensee would have. Uh, so I think it was a little bit of an easier lift for us than it might be uh, for some others. Uh, but uh, to the point that was just made, uh, the ability to get alignment with your various reporters, producers, and editors is much higher when you have a single reporting structure and a unified reporting structure. Um, you know, on some level, we're wired to be tribal, and uh, and, and, and 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 so the th anything that you can do to try to break that tribal behavior down is going to make your organization both more productive and more responsive. I can certainly attest to that now, being over all of it. But I was going to make a slightly different point, which is that I, th I think the most um, innovative organizational thing that we've done is to is basically adapt um, Scrum, Agile software development techniques from Silicon Valley and bring it into the news organization. I mean, it goes to Rosie's point of getting the journalists together with the engineers and figuring out. I mean, this is there's a huge amount of cross disciplinary play that has to go on. Um, and, you know, where five or six years ago you could think about taking your content, you know, the task was to figure out how to be a multimedia organization, but then it was pretty much splattering it onto whatever platforms were there. Now those platforms are rich enough and complex enough that you have to be thinking about each one of them and how the content plays and so forth. And, and the problem almost becomes exponential. Getting those teams to play together, whether they're coming up with solutions that can be repeated over and over again, or even with more ambitious projects doing it as one-offs, uh, is invaluable, and they work in you know it's a very particular kind of methodology where they're they're given a task, they're working in two week sprints, they're they they have accountability within the team, uh, they're not directed from above, um, and it's it's remarkable. It obviously works in a software development environment, but it's been interesting to see how it can begin to bleed out into the newsroom. Adam Astor, the uh, Adam asked earlier about collaboration, and I was, it's, this is a completely old school collaboration, but we were approached right as we began the Hidden World of Girls series to, um, by the Creative Work Fund, which is a group here that funds collaborations with organizations that wouldn't traditionally ever work together. And a contemporary music festival approached us. Um, Marin Alsop, you probably know her from Baltimore and Public Radio, is the conductor, and they wanted to take our Hidden World of Girls series and make a symphonic work out of it. And they, we then partnered with Obscura Digital, which I hope people know about their work. And it was a 90-minute, it was called the Hidden World of Girls Stories for Orchestra. It was major symphony orchestra, weaving in radio stories, visuals, very multimedia piece. And I just urge us to take this, these stories, this content, and think about those other kinds of collaborative roles, too. Thank you. I just want to, I want to wrap up. And um, Adam's going to finish up in a couple minutes. Before we hit that, uh, I need your attention for about five or ten more minutes. I'm, gonna, I'm first going to tell you what I'd like to do, and, and I'm going to speak for a few minutes to give you a chance to think about it. <clears throat> what are the few things, one or two things, that you would like to suggest that, that somebody should do? It could be CPB is here. Vinny's got his ears open to him. <laughs> you've got NPR here. You've got indie producers here. You've got some academic centers here. There's quite a bit of firepower in the room. Uh, what are the one or two things that we could do? Because I'll go back to what I said at the opening. This is not a two-hour, three-hour meeting that, oh, now everybody's going to got this figured out. It's probably a five-year process through which the existing organizations are gradually changed to become more better adapted to the environment they find themselves in. So make a few suggestions, if you don't mind, as I go around. But I want to start with a piece about us a little bit. I'm going to go back to my opening again. Uh, I, I'm not as eloquent as the president, but we are in some ways the change we are imagining. 
I do think there are about a thousand people in the country who are in control of the public media properties that reach, that provide 80 percent of the impact of public media. And we've got a substantial portion of that group in this room. So, again, this is a, if you just look at public broadcasting alone, it's a $3 billion business. It is slightly smaller than the National Hockey League. It, it is a substantial sized thing, and you wouldn't believe that sometimes listening to pledge drives. <clears throat> but we are large, with a large Im impact and a potentially even larger role as the, the, the money, I remember living across the street from Robert Rosenthal, he, he would tell me, it's not that we're not making money at the Philadelphia Inquirer, it's just that we're not making enough money. That's our problem. And now you've moved into an environment where, in fact, it is, money is pretty scarce. Even with $3 billion, there's a feeling of scarcity. Money has to be moved around. And the organizations that control a lot of the resources probably do need to adapt themselves by leaning outward towards groups like you're doing who can provide content, towards professional organizations like we have here. You know, some sort of process is going to unfold. Much of it is going to be funded, if my analysis is correct, by foundation support and major donors. Somewhere along the line, it has to get sufficient traction so that there is some kind of popular base that begins to say, this is so important, I'll actually pay for it. And that process is just beginning to unfold. It took about 40 years in public broadcasting. So it's probably going to be sped up. So let me ask you, what are the, what are the couple of things, if anybody wants to take a lead, that could be done? And it isn't, isn't necessarily we're going to do it, but what, what are the couple of things? Do you mind going first if you have a few suggestions? Yeah. I'm, I'll speak about the local or project, which CPB and WinCote have um, been part of funding. Uh, it's an air project, and why I bring them up is because it's not one project that's been uh, supported, too. It's an experiment that brings together independents and public radio stations and partner to create multi-platform storytelling, uh, audio at its heart, but on all platforms. It's a series of ten projects that are happening simultaneously across the country. And I think that's a model t for people to be thinking about is, um, it, I'm not just collaborating with KQED, I care about the North Dakota project, the Boston project, that we're all pushing each other's work forward and sharing the innovation. I, I, I just got a very good report on Chicago's uh, use of the uh, Curious Curious City. Curious City is city, yeah. one of the Curious Which City, you might take a look at. and KCRW has Well, really says one or two things you want to suggest yeah, just passed on to Bruce. Okay. Well, it, I think I think Judy, you made me think of this, but you know, the academic institutions, the journalism programs, if they're not teaching cross-platform and and they're still in their isolation, we're not getting any of the um, uh, uh, the next uh, the next generation of journalists we need. And I know, again, there's been some innovation at, at a, a few universities and colleges. Again, some of our hyper-local sites come out of the fact that Stanford and Berkeley are both have done away with the newspaper and are now reporting um, across media through these kind of situations. But I, I think that's huge. I don't know. We can't train them. A lot of them are, are doing it on their own, but I'm concerned about our academic institutions. Oh, I'd love to comment on that. My colleague Andrew Lee is here as well, and I'm sure he can back me up. We are totally multi-platform. They go out and they get jobs because they are completely trained in all the – all those ways. Uh, we have Neon Tommy, which is one of the most uh, highly read uh, websites in college or otherwise in the country, breaking news all the time, headed by Mark Cooper. Um, I mean, yes. Yeah. Well, I certainly encourage it, uh, public radio especially, and, it, and they're hiring. When, once you, all you have to do is say, you know where the jobs are? You know, they'll come sign up for my radio class. But, um, and public television, not so much, obviously, because it's, it's, it's not as thriving a, a news organization right now. But um, I would also like, I saw that on WHYY's uh, Newsworks thing on your partners, you have at least three or four educational partners. I don't know what the level of involvement is, but I would really encourage all of you to think about partnering. I mean, we 
they aren't ready. We have to edit them. We have to get them in shape for that. But it's, it's a way to draw in young people and young stories. Uh, one of my groups broke a story. It was on uh, Good Morning America actually ran it. Uh, but they, they found this group of kids down on the border in Naco, Arizona, who instead of the Boy Scouts or the Girl Scouts, they go into junior border patrol work. They have uniforms. They learn how to handcuff people. And they go out at night and chase immigrants. So it was quite, and so that's the kind of story you wouldn't get necessarily. So I would encourage you to partner with us I, I, to look for that kind of material. Yeah, the two things that I would want to see us do as a system is uh, acquire or develop uh, CRM systems and data analytic capacity. We simply don't know what our audience is doing digitally, and we have to understand that, and we have to be able to use those data to inform our content creation. That's number one. Number two, I think um, whether we acquire it or develop it, uh, we simply need mobile digital uh, capacity and, and, and Vinny, I would absolutely include mobile video in that. I mean, that's a critical uh, future success uh, measure for us. Uh, two suggestions. One, I think we have to find a way to um, build capacity at rural uh, institutions, at rural radio stations. Every issue that's going on in this country is going on in rural areas, and they are. They simply do not have the capacity, in spite of the quality of service that they're providing to their communities, to do the kind of work that um, we've been talking about today. Right. The second thing I would love to see is, um, as we talk about these new platforms, um, using new platforms, using gaming to reach younger people with our messages. I want. We've got to. We've got to. Um, we've got to start modeling. Find ways to actually change the internal cultures of our organizations, so that it's not just partners that we are hiring people who know how to design games, but they are part of the culture. Whether that's. Um, I mean, we could look at who is in this room today, and what we all, what most of us have in common. Um, and it's, this is very typical of the public broadcasting system. And if we're going to reach new audiences, we need to bring the new audiences into our organizations and institutions and be willing to change our internal cultures so that um, we are, the, the content creators are the people for whom the content is being created. Um, yeah, just, just to echo also what... Oh, okay. Um, what Judy said, um, I came in late, so sorry. I, I teach at USC uh, in the new media track. I also have written a book about Wikipedia. By coincidence, I was just at Wikipedia's offices about seven blocks away from here yesterday. And believe it or not, they, as you've probably seen, a pretty dominant position. Number five most visited website in the world. Only Google, Yahoo, Microsoft are more popular than Wikipedia worldwide. Very lucrative um, organization. They make a lot of money from fundraising. Whenever you see Jimmy Wales' head, they have a profile that's similar to public radio, about $23 per donation. Um, they are cash positive in a major way. They are going through exercises very similar to this right now, saying what is that disruptive thing that will make us irrelevant even just two years from now? So even they are looking at this problem um, because you never know. And they have done a lot to try to engage the audience in, in ways that probably will surprise you. So a few things to mention. One, I think we saw a lot of the themes here saying that I think it's true that public radio and public media has the highest trust um, 
coefficient out there among the public. But I think that also holds you back in many ways in being daring and being bold. I really want to charge you folks to try new things without thinking that you're going to destroy your brand overnight. You have a lot of trust built up. Don't be afraid of trying new things. Um, especially in the Los Angeles area, we had major stories, Pulitzer Prize winning stories about corruption in Bell, in, uh, you know, corruption in the education system, covering up sex scandals. And if you look at the discussion areas of the LA Times and KPCC, there's not a lot of robust discussion going on. This should be a real locus of uh, community um, social media activity, and it really is not happening. And there could be a real big part that public media plays in this. Two very quick things. One on the content side, what we've heard about data um, collaborations, what Stevens mentioned, what um, Rosie's mentioned, what you've done with Budget Hero, the ability to bring a lot of data together, bring it in one place in a collaborative way so it can reach people and be localized by many others. It's an incredibly powerful synergistic thing. And the other piece is going back to the social piece, is that it's all about community. And I, I would ask everyone here to consider and funders to consider Social media is no longer just about posting tweets and Facebook posts. It, there, it's really becoming a discipline now about social media monitoring and listening, reaching out to where people are on the web, and then building communities around that, and funding collaborative projects to bring new people into the public media sphere on that very disciplined way. Not big grand things, but very focused things, like what we're trying to do with immigrants, I think is huge. A quick idea about uh, crazy schemes. Uh, as some of you know, I, I spent 16 years at CBS News beginning in the 1960s, and early on I was in a meeting like this, except I had a role uh, sort of like Sarah's. So I was off in the corner and nobody was paying attention to me. And the meeting was about how do we reach kids with CBS News. And somebody said, well, you know, we have these Saturday morning cartoons. Oh, we can't uh, partner with them. Well, but let's see, how does Kellogg sell sugar pops and Rice Krispies? They have 30-second uh, commercials. Well, gee, can we have a 30-second news something that runs on Saturday mornings in all those cartoon shows? which became in the news uh, and uh, ran for some years on, on CBS on Sunday, uh, Saturday mornings. So there's sort of an analogy now. How is Kellogg's going to try to sell sugar pops and Rice Krispies to kids today? And the answer is they're now doing this. Uh, they're spending $10,000 to do uh, game apps for uh, uh, smartphones. And it is incredibly successful. Not that this is you know, a model which we should all be looking at, but it's, an, it's, a, it's, it's sort of one of the ideas that's out there that uh, people like uh, uh, Kellogg's and Kraft and uh, some of the other major food companies are saying, okay, this is how we do this. We have a super pretzel game, and that's how we educate kids to buy our pretzels. Maybe we can do something better than that, a, uh, uh, other types of uh, game apps which can educate kids to do something else. Okay, well, thank, every, thank, uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you, uh, almost all of you, for coming early. Uh, thanks to several of you for flying across the country to come here. And uh, uh, we don't have a date for the next one. Uh, actually, November 20, you're doing something, right? In New Orleans. In New Orleans. Um, and there will be another one in Washington, uh, also in late fall, early winter. So watch that space. Uh, and uh, we'll keep, uh, keep you all informed. There will be reports on the current.org site and on, uh, as well as on uh, the USC site. Uh, we don't have word yet on how um, uh, Bloomberg is going to cache the, uh, the webcast, but uh, we'll get word to that to you. Right, right, right. Yes. So, again, thank you very much. Um, how many of you are going to ONA? Okay, very good. We'll see you uh, over at the Hyatt this afternoon. <laughs> Thank you.